hello just seeing people arrive over here obviously i'm oh i'm on time now it's 2020 i'm glowing i have a drink too i've got two drinks Hello, everyone again. So I don't know if that will be, for now at least, that will be the last part in the series because there's not enough interest in me doing a full-on uh, hypnosis series. A policeman just ran past. Not here. Yeah, there's not much interest in uh, me doing a full-on um series uh trying to work through teaching um hypnotherapy so for now that will be the last one and this will be the last live session Yeah, if I sell all my books, I'll have to take a photo of them first, just so that I can keep looking like I've got books. Thing is, out of the almost 100,000 people taking my Udemy courses, uh, and I've told them, obviously, about this, uh series pretty much no one has come over here to watch it um even to so one of my arguments on udemy was um this is an opportunity even if it's not specifically about the lesson that goes on beforehand it's an opportunity to talk to the instructor of the udemy courses and ask questions of me um rather than try and just put a question in the chat on the Udemy course and hope that I get around to answering it. And then obviously you don't get to, well, you can follow it up, but obviously time takes place because I have to type an answer. They type another question. I type an answer. Um, and obviously with uh, um, time zones and things, normally people end up typing questions overnight I answer them the next day and then they read it that night and then they answer it another time. Um, but yeah, they, no one on Udemy particularly seemed interested. I think a couple of people came over here for one of the streams, but uh, no one's really seemed interested, which is obviously also the reason why I stopped. I closed down the um, Facebook group uh, that was had like, I don't know, three and a half thousand people or something in it uh when i closed it down because although it had three and a half thousand people in it and i was getting about 15 to 20 people a day requesting to join the group and i asked questions for joining and it was like you know i'm a student of yours on udemy i want to learn and interact with people and talk to other students and uh, so i would let them into the group and then no one would interact there was myself and tony um who some of you probably know who would uh post all of the questions and pretty much be just myself tony richard hill um being the ones who would then reply and interact with each other while actually the reality of it was that myself and tony were trying to stimulate um debate from others and interaction from others who want to learn uh, and no one seemed interested in using the breakout room feature on Facebook groups. 
where you can do like live interactive kind of zoom like uh chats or any of these things so i obviously closed the group because i don't use facebook and was only using facebook just to keep the group open just to sort of have be there for students who wanted the support and with no and if i didn't let students into the group because i initially stopped just letting people into the group um they were complaining that i wasn't letting them in the group and so i would then let them in the group and they wouldn't interact so uh it's obviously the same here that there's not really much value in doing it um and it's not viable obviously financially if i can't get the interest so obviously today's one uh, i've got at least the first probably 40 hours or so of videos mapped out not created obviously uh, but mapped out um and uh, i'll probably only pick them up if there ends up being a lot of interest at some point in the future if people come to the channel and sort of think oh i didn't realize this was here when's the next one and if there's lots and lots of people asking for it then obviously i'll do it but currently there isn't um but my plan was that the important part was the live bit after the lesson so that you know it's the bit that's kind of off the cuff and it's the bit that on a live training if you rather than say just taking a udemy course where it's just a video then another video another video um the advantage of a live training is you just get to talk to the instructor and interact with them and um spend some time asking questions about the material rather than just being taught the next bit um when you might have good questions that aren't covered in the material because you don't think to cover it or uh, maybe it's not the right place to cover it or whatever um so yeah so it was the live bits that i thought would be more of the the popular thing uh, which technically it is there's 12 of you here there was only seven i think during the uh the actual lesson I do look like I could be in front of a green screen with the light behind me. I was just sort of looking at my outline. It is a lot easier than having to go and answer via text. Um, it's so much easier for me to kind of gather up the questions that I get asked and do a live video, say once a week or something, or once a fortnight, where I have some questions to answer already that people have asked, and then I answer other questions, than... Um, trying to it takes so many hours to type out replies to people uh given the replies i often type out to people because i try and answer questions fully and um i try and give examples in my answers and all these other bits and pieces uh, as abby often points out to me i over type i write a novel in every answer pretty much um so yeah so i try and answer as fully as i can i try and give examples in the answer um i just try and be as helpful as i can with what i'm saying and so that's obviously so much easier to talk it than it is to um and i can then get follow-up bits if i'm not making myself clear or something someone can butt in there and then um rather than just typing it and often i get the same questions over and over again <clears throat> even though they're already there so the number of times that I get asked the same question and the question is already on the same let uh, same uh, course and already answered and already visible to students if they choose to look and see if their question has already been answered before I answer it um, they'll ask the question again and obviously as has happened on YouTube if I end up saying something like oh go here and you can find the answer I get 
people being abusive um so i've had that on youtube and i've had it on udemy where it's like i shouldn't have to search for the answer if you've had time to type to tell me to search for the answer you've had time to tell me the answer here and now instead um like when people say do you have a website or you know do you have a playlist for this and i can't on the youtube app i can't click off the question to go and find a playlist and save it on my mobile app and then go back to the question to then paste it and so i can't do all that on my mobile phone so i would say go to the playlists here's the name of the playlist you'll find that playlist and it'll be like i shouldn't have to search for it um so i get the same kind of thing whether i'm on udemy or over here on youtube um so it's so much easier if i can do it uh face to face like this um obviously when there's a holly so they're currently on my top chat why am i on top chatting i literally was on live chat and i'm the one holding the stream and it's changed my settings um yeah when there's a holly around obviously someone says oh does dan have a playlist for that or does dan have a video of that or does dan have this suddenly it appears um as a link faster than i've been able to track it down and copy it and paste it and stuff but there isn't a holly scanning every question on every video on youtube or on my e-courses Yeah, I think the best thing about the implementation intentions, so if then thing, is to obviously focus on one thing at a time um, and not try and do everything at once. I think there's a temptation to think I've got to fix these 30 things and you try it on everything, but then your attention is not on anything. I'm sure Holly does know which story Pickles the Cat was in. I think Pickles the Cat has been in two stories. Um, I don't know if you're talking about the... Um, uh, evacuee story. I think that was the first story that Pickles appeared in. Yeah, here you're also on the wrong uh, channel. So you have to go to my other channel to find the answer. But yeah, that's the story I suspect you're probably talking about. The one based around my nan. Yeah, there was uh, about 64 five or 67 stories created during the creation sessions It's not so much hypnosis isn't real, it's hypnosis doesn't exist. Technically. So most people who do things like studying hypnosis or what have you would kind of maintain uh, that, yeah, it's probably tiddles actually, um, would kind of maintain that hypnosis technically doesn't exist. It, it ends up coming down to how you end up defining hypnosis. So that's been something that has been kind of the bane of hypnosis researchers' lives, trying to define hypnosis, because if you define hypnosis in the kind of common way of it being about focusing um, attention then um, and increasing responsiveness, then pretty much everything is hypnosis. 
there's no actual state called hypnosis so that already in terms of saying does hypnosis exist as a state it doesn't that's there just isn't a state called hypnosis um and that's the general consensus of scientific researchers nowadays um that generally the the thinking is most scientific researchers will take a socio-cognitive approach to hypnosis that it's about communication and interaction it's not about a state it's about people deciding to engage and follow along to the presented ideas to the point where they are doing so automatically um so generally you'll find most hypnosis researchers at least most people who study hypnosis as a scientific thing rather than say taking some training course that says it's the alpha state or some random other weird thing that people will claim um yeah i think there is one with pickles i get confused it's quite easy to find i imagine if the cat name is in the description because you just go to my videos you search my among my videos so you go to the search box that searches among my videos and just type in the cat name and uh if i've mentioned the cat in the description of one of the videos then it will come up in theory um but yeah so technically hypnosis doesn't exist because hypnosis is just a term for uh the way of communicating in the same way that solution focused therapy as a thing doesn't technically exist it's a term given to a bunch of ways of communicating and interacting with people or motivational interviewing or cognitive behavioral therapy <clears throat> none of these in exist as a an actual thing they're not like a state of being in cognitive behavioral therapy or a state of being in motivational interviewing um or a state of being in whatever it happens to be um uh, i've no idea why what youtube decides to recommend to anyone um but yeah so technically as an actual thing hypnosis doesn't exist it's just about communicating um there's not a state called hypnosis in the same way there's not a state called nlp or whatever um uh that would depend i think the thing with loud noises and bangs is as I, i've talked to you before or mentioned before on streams when this has come up um that i worked with a woman who said she had a fear of loud noises and I sort of asked her to describe it and she said when there's a loud noise I jump and I then get anxious and I said then what happens and she said well once I know what it is or once it's gone I then kind of think and I calm down and that's kind of normal that and her response to me saying that was normal is oh you've got the same thing and I also jump at loud noises and obviously like everyone does um and that I doubt you could ever treat because that's obviously a survival response that is instinctive it's built in and it's supposed to be there uh, you are supposed to jump you're supposed to get anxious when you hear loud noises it would be dangerous to not have that uh, so it's trying to differentiate from the normal response of being anxious when there's a loud noise compared to something that's an abnormal response where maybe you know the loud noise has happened but five ten fifteen minutes later you're still um having a panic attack or something that is a very abnormal kind of response and that's one that you would then look at okay what's causing that to happen uh in relation to me and in relation to me being autistic one of the things that overloads me from a sensory perspective is uh loud noises um and i normally react with kind of inner anger and that inner anger lingers for a very long time 
So if I'm walking down a road and just as an ambulance, if an ambulance, if I can hear an ambulance coming from a long way off or a police car or whatever, so I hear the siren coming from a long distance away, I know that it's going to be loud as it passes me and it's fine. But if it decides to play the siren just as it's passing me, so when it's really close to me, that will make me suddenly normally swear and suddenly feel an intense rush of anger and that anger will last for a chunk of time afterwards where i'm still sort of you know effing things really effing wound me up and I'm, I'm just really worked up for ages afterwards unless i can distract myself with something or do something to kind of end that and i'm not anxious about it or anything it's just a kind of um overlying it's just that lasts after me uh, after the incidents happened um and so yeah that's the uh the same with any other loud noise like like if a child starts crying i react the same but i instantly get that if it's out of the blue so if a child's crying and i'm approaching the child or the child's crying and i um you know, the child is getting closer to me so i'm not approaching them they're approaching me or whatever then it's annoying but it's it doesn't make me angry but if all of a sudden i hear a child crying and screaming that then internally makes me incredibly angry um it rarely any anger within me rarely gets out of me it just sits there but um Yeah, the anticipation is obviously uh, an anxiety inducing thing as anticipation can be of you kind of know that there's a chance that something might make you jump or something might be about to happen that's potentially unpleasant. Um, and in the old days, it doesn't happen to me anymore, but in the old days, things like if someone tried to give me the bumps, uh, not just one person, but if a whole bunch of people were trying to bundle me, give me the bumps, tickle me, do any of those kind of things, if people started approaching me and they were threatening to do something like that, it would cause that same kind of uh, anticipation that it's going to happen and that I'm not going to like it, even though technically at that exact moment in time, nothing I dislike has actually happened. It's just being threatened to happen. Then my response rather than being anxiety always seems to go to anger first so i would in the case of when it's people i would state anything that comes within my personal space so i'd have like a circle around me and i'd point out anything that comes within that circle i will destroy i will break it and i would just be very blunt about that and i would then if someone went to grab me i would try and break the person's arm i would do whatever i have to do to protect me from the thing I dislike. So I've always seemed to respond with anger rather than anxiety to these kind of things. But um, it's because of the sort of suddenly being having that sensory overload. And to this day, I've never ever found a way no, without using things like headphones or whatever. I've never ever found a way of actually addressing the sensory overload as a thing so it's not obviously i don't know your full experience but for me it's not say a fear of loud noises it's when it happens i get i i know that if it happens i'm going to feel angry instantly and so there's not a kind of fear there or anything it's just that i end up knowing that's going to happen and i will be overwhelmed uh, and I don't like being overwhelmed and I've never found a way to kind of uh, as I say like psychologically like therapy wise or anything to dumb down my senses almost to kind of turn them down enough to make it to, so that I can cope Suggest well, it's hypnosis doesn't increase suggestibility, so you don't become more suggestible because of hypnosis itself. So, suggestibility would be 
someone being more likely to not be able to choose not to do what you say. So I could say, uh, I want you to lift up your right arm. And if someone was more suggestible, then that would be, um, you know, they might sort of think I'm fighting the suggestion. I don't want to do it. And yet it's happening against my will because this person has got me hypnotized. And so because I'm hypnotized, that is why this is happening against my will kind of thing. Responsivity is someone does it better. Someone responds better to you. So they respond to more subtle uh, ways of communicating. They respond um, easier on a sort of instinctive level. They find it easier to just keep to respond to things. So they can choose not to respond. They're not more suggestible. They're not suddenly unable to go back on the you know to sort of ignore the suggestion. They can still ignore the suggestion if they want to, but if they decide to engage with it, they're more responsive. They're better able to do what you're suggesting. So someone could be hypnotized to lift up their left arm and you hypnotize them. And then you say, uh, in a moment, I want you to lift up your left arm. And let's be very direct about this. In a moment, your left arm will lift up. So you say that to somebody. If they were more suggestible, then the idea would be that because, you know, normal, so say you've said exactly the same thing before hypnotizing them. So they're sat there and you say, I want you to lift up your left arm and consciously they can just decide, OK, I'll lift up my left arm. But you can say to them, I don't want you to do this because you've decided to do this. I want you to do this because I am making you do this. So they then sort of would sit there. You've asked them to lift up their left arm. They'll sit there. They won't lift up their left arm because they'll think you've told me not to do it on purpose. If it happens, it's because of your suggestion. And uh, so someone being, you know, perhaps more suggestible, when you've hypnotized them and you say the same thing, they would then sort of think, oh, my God, my left arm is lifting on its own. And that could happen, but it could happen through responsiveness rather than, you know, because they're more responsive to what you're, you've asked them to do. But if they were suggestible, they wouldn't be able to necessarily, more suggestible, they wouldn't necessarily be able to fight that suggestion or ignore that suggestion. That they're kind of, the idea of suggestibility would be that you've put them in a state where they're, they find it harder to fight suggestions. So they are more suggestible. Uh, that's not the case though with hypnosis. What they are is more responsive. So you do a similar kind of thing. You say to somebody, I don't want you to do anything on purpose. Just if something happens, it happens. Don't do anything on purpose. You say the same thing before you hypnotize them. I want you to lift up your left arm. And they obviously think I'm not going to lift up my left arm because you've told me not to do it on purpose. And then you hypnotize them and say, I want you to lift up your left arm. And you might have to wait a while. And if they're happy to do it, then their arm will lift. Um, so the idea is being more responsive just means you respond more or easier being more suggestible would be that somebody has less ability to kind of go against suggestion they they're more likely to do the suggestions you tell them because you're telling them to do them because you've hypnotized them and that isn't what happens some people it will happen with because of things like you're an authority figure and some people will believe oh this is how i'm supposed to respond so this is how I'll respond. But there's also the flip side where there's a lot of people who think you're a hypnotist. So you think you're trying to make me do something I don't want to do. So I'm not going to do it. So some people take the idea that you've presented and they do the opposite and they don't do the suggestion because they think you're trying to manipulate them. Uh, so you get both ends. You get a small group that don't do it because they think you're trying to manipulate them. So they're less suggestible. You get another group where they think this is how I'm supposed to respond. So they do more of it. And then you get the group in the middle that kind of respond like they would, you know, like anyone else.
well the idea of so obviously suggestibility would be uh you know are people responding to suggestions but the idea of increased suggestibility is like saying somebody is more likely to uh follow the suggestions because they've been hypnotized that isn't what happens you're not more likely to do it you're just better able to do it so if someone's being responsive so let's say same kind of example hypnotize someone i want to get an arm levitation and i then uh, when i'm opposite the person uh, i then kind of i'm sort of talking to them and i start talking about oh do you remember when you're a kid and you're trying to and i act, they've got their eyes shut and i'm sort of acting it out uh, while i'm saying it because that helps me to be congruent in how i'm communicating so i'm there saying um Oh, do you remember when you were a kid and you'd be on your tiptoes and you'd be stretching up trying to reach for that cupboard to put something in the top shelf and i'm sort of telling these stories about lifting your arm up and then i see a little twitch in the back of that the say left hand or whatever most people are right hand it's a probably their right hand i then say that's it so i acknowledge that i've seen that twitch they are more responsive so that means whereas if they weren't hypnotized they'd probably not notice that me saying that's it was said directly in line with the fact they've just had a twitch in the back of their hand but because they're hypnotized they make that connection non-consciously between me saying that's it and the back of their hand twitching so i then carry on talking about things uh like lightness and um taking the lift right arm up to the uh top of a shopping mall all these sort of things that you do when you're covertly kind of uh giving ideas and then all of a sudden there are um, say a finger twitches or something and i then say that's it again and they then make the connection non-consciously again they don't consciously realize this that i've said that in line with the twitch and so they connect me saying that's it with them responding non-consciously and then um they end up you know with their arms starting to lift off their lap or something and then i start saying that's it and it can continue to happen all by itself and you can watch that happen and so you then start having them as an observer on their automatic behavior rather than them being taking an active role in that automatic behavior so you're kind of evoking it rather than um you're evoking this behavior rather than actually telling someone what to do and hoping they do it because you've told them to do it um but yeah so the responsiveness is they just respond much better at it so another example is in a stage show for example you could say to somebody uh i want you to walk around the stage like a chicken and the person could not be hypnotized and they'll be able to do a certain level of kind of ability at walking around the stage like a chicken they might be self-conscious at the time uh they might sort of think this is a little embarrassing and so they, they don't really engage in it very well they're not very responsive to what you've just you know the idea you've just suggested if someone is hypnotized if it was about the suggestion like the suggestibility then they would still be able to walk around like a chicken just like they could before but when it's about responsivity what they do is they respond better to the idea so instead of doing it as a very kind of i don't know fake obviously it's always fake because you're walking around like a chicken but you know a, a very poor poorly convincing version of that what they do is they put much more of themselves into it and they do perhaps even subtle things that chickens do that if they were to consciously just walk around like a chicken they would never think to do so certain chicken behaviors that they've observed that are in their memory of how chickens respond under hypnosis they're more likely to include some of those subtle behaviors like certain head movements or whatever that they wouldn't do if they were just consciously doing it because they're now more responsive to the idea they're more responsive to kind of engaging in that fully um
there's not a lot of correlation between a lot of those things. Um, some people are more suggestible if they are the kind of person that perhaps is very uncertain about things. Um, yeah, and turns to others to know what to do in any given situation. So people who naturally turn to others, like, what should I do in this situation? What should I, not asking it, but, you know, they just instinctively want to copy everyone else and want to kind of fit in or whatever, then they're going to respond much better, you know, be technically more suggestible, more likely to just do as they're told uh, because that's the type of person they are. Then you get other people that are the opposite who just don't like being told what to do, don't like towing the line, don't like, uh, you know, kind of following uh, trends and things. So you start telling them what to do and they dislike that. They don't want to do it because you're telling them to do it. So obviously how you come across when you're working with different people, you would always tailor it to the individual. So you're not going to say to somebody who doesn't like being told what to do, I want you to do this now and tell them to do something because they'll probably think, who are you to tell me what to do and then not do it. Um, generally with things like age, the idea is that children are generally better at, children are more imaginative and more willing to be involved and sort of engaged in their imaginative world. So generally, children respond a lot better to that kind of thing. And that kind of fades as people get older. And then once you hit adulthood, it's relatively stable. So you might change opinions and things when you grow up. But generally, in terms of things like how hypnotizable you are or um, how good you are at engaging in imaginative things, all that sort of stuff kind of reaches a point as uh, adulthood where it fixes pretty stably and they've done studies with hypnosis where they've done hypnosis uh tests to see like how many different you might have like 20 different items on the test and it's how many of those does the person respond to that mixes like hallucination time distortion all these different kind of phenomena that you would class as hypnotic phenomena you have all of that being tested with someone and then over the years you keep testing that group of people and what you find is that generally it's pretty stable uh, year after year after year. So unless someone's specifically putting effort in to learn to improve their responsiveness, their hypnotic responsiveness, like you know, putting effort into, say you're not very good at hallucinating, so you put in lots of effort to learn to hallucinate, then some people can do that and then get a bit better at it, just like people can learn to respond better to hypnosis. But if you're just tested like once a year or once a decade or whatever, you don't really learn enough to improve much different as decades go on. Uh, I don't know what the current rate is on how many decades have, people have been tested for. I know that um, it's a very long time. I know that I, in the past, had seen reports of people trapped for like 50 or 60 years and we're still responding just the same. And the same with uh, post-hypnotic suggestions. People were given post-hypnotic suggestions and tested over decades and would still respond to those same post-hypnotic suggestions exactly the same. They won't have worn out despite many decades passing, um, which is uh, interesting. Um, And whether someone's introverted or extroverted might make them respond slightly different to certain things. But once they're hypnotized, it won't make a lot of difference. So generally, when someone's hypnotized, introverted people can appear not extroverted, but they can appear comfortable with what they're doing. And the same extroverted people will just appear comfortable with what they're doing. Um, that doesn't make a lot of difference in relation to that. Uh, in relation to, for example, hypnotizability, there's the things that seem to be correlated with uh, hypnotizability are can someone focus their attention and kind of hold their attention on something? And people who can't focus and hold their attention on something 
if you're using a standard induction, which is the important kind of point there, if you're using a standard induction, generally that's a sign of somebody who's then not, doesn't respond so well. Uh, so normally you have, you want the person to be able to focus their attention and be willing to kind of put, uh, suspend their belief a bit. So if you're asking, so in relation to certain things that people test for, for in relation to hypnosis, normally they're things where the person has to suspend their belief a bit. So you're asking them to do things like you're you're doing tests of hypnotic phenomena. So you're asking them, for example, to hallucinate, to change time, their perception of time. And all of those obviously require a certain level of being willing to uh, you know, put aside what you believe about reality just for a moment. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not that likely to respond to when you're asked to do things that kind of make you, uh, you know, kind of push up against your version of what you think reality is. Um, but you can still hypnotize people who, for example, struggle with focus. Uh, you can, you just can't do something that's like a boring, long, drawn out, single focused type of thing. The same with meditation. That kind of person also doesn't respond particularly well to a long, drawn out meditation where they have to try and hold their focus on one thing for an extended period of time. So what you do is obviously you work with how that person is. So I, for example, have shared the meditation I did to a group where someone in the group before the meditation starts, someone in the group uh, has said, you know, I, I was there teaching a course, a well-being weekend, and they, they said, um, I've tried hypnosis, I've tried meditation, nothing has ever worked. I've never been able to experience it, but I really, really want to because I'm into fitness. I love fitness, uh, but because I've got ADHD, it just doesn't work for me because people will say, sit there, cross your legs, and focus on the sound of this bell that I'm going to tap at the front of the room. And I'm there kind of with my mind wandering all over the place and it just doesn't end up working. And so I, in the audience, I was sort of chatting to them saying, oh, that's really interesting. Tell me what sort of things do you do then? You know, how do you spend your time? You say you're into fitness and stuff. And they said, oh, I, I do mountain biking. And um, there's nothing better than that feeling of, you know, dragging your bike up a mountain you know cycling up a mountain or dragging your bike up a mountain knowing you can bomb it down the other side and um you know being off road on your bike and he was saying all this kind of stuff that he found exciting and so the meditation that i've posted i think on my other channel uh is from that session where i then do a meditation about dragging your bike up to the top of a hill up into some woodland and then bombing it down the other side and having to focus so hard on keeping control of the bike as you're dodging you know branches and you're jumping over tree roots and you're you know coming out of the forest uh, out of the woodland onto a narrow path and so you're now having to try and keep it on the narrow path and and at the end of it he sort of I, I sort of asked how everyone found that when everyone came back to the room and I, I was asking for feedback and what did people think and everyone was like wow that was so incredible it was brilliant loved it and he was the same he took his time coming back. He was one of the last to open his eyes and said he'd never, ever experienced anything like it. He'd never, ever experienced meditation or hypnosis or anything because he'd always found himself to just have his mind drift off and wander off somewhere else. And then he'd distract himself and then he'd start noticing, uh, you know, sensations in his body that would distract him and itches and all things like that. And he said, yeah, this totally engaged him. He loved the the kind of story or the tale about dragging a bike up a hill he could totally relate to that he loved getting it to the top he loved he could really imagine that sensation of bombing it down the other side and and he found himself so engaged in it that he forgot about his body there he forgot when i stopped talking that you know in a short period of time you can come back to the room and he was just still there and forgot his mind had gone quiet and he totally forgot to come back to the room um and so for him it was a transformative never had before kind of experience so you can do this with people who struggle with focus but you have to make sure you're tailoring it to how they do focus and to having a single focus but the focus at point is jumping from one thing to another so you're essentially guiding that single point of focus um 
a long. I scrolled up so I could read something. So now I have to scroll down and it will jump all over the place. Uh, I've so far never seen any scientific evidence of people being able to read minds for real. Um, depending on what what how someone defines things so what you can do for real is you can learn to read minimal cues you can learn to read uh the throat you can learn to read the lips the face and the breathing pattern that someone has so you can learn all of that and then you can put yourself in tune with somebody so that you can then take on what someone's doing so that you can then take on their breathing and you're then mimicking their breathing and when you talk to yourself in your head your breathing moves to in beat with what you're saying in your own head. You sort of breathe out in little bursts, just as if you were talking out loud, except you're doing it in your own head. Um, and Milton, I've spoken about this lots of times before, but Milton Erickson, the psychiatrist, um, was really intrigued by a few things. One, in his early days, he was intrigued by something he termed... Um, subliminal auditory stimulation which is being able to and i've done a video on that so that's being able to um, pick up on the breathing patterns of others so he was tone deaf and um, had various other problems and he asked one day in school why does everyone breathe when there was a concert going on why does everyone breathe the same as the singer and his teachers said you're stupid people don't breathe the same as the singer shut up and they dismissed him and didn't want anything wants to know about anything so he then looked into this and he realized that people do breathe the same as other people that when someone falls into rapport with someone like when you're watching a singer or when you're with a friend you breathe the same as the other person you start falling into that kind of sink and you start because you're breathing the same it means that when one of you thinks something because you're both breathing the same, the other one of you is more likely to then also think that same thing. And so you start almost seeming psychic. You, know, you start sharing these thoughts because um, you're both breathing the same sentences to, as each other or the same words. And you say, yeah, that's weird. I was just thinking that or I was just humming that tune. And so what Erickson did was he learned how to breathe uh, breathing patterns of different songs, popular songs at the time. He then sat next to people in school uh, on benches. He'd sit next to them and he'd start breathing the pop. He'd match their breathing first. So he'd be copying the breathing of the person sat next to him. And then he would start breathing the popular song. And what he would notice is that the person sat next to him would start humming or whistling or singing the song that he was breathing because they picked up on his subliminally on his breathing pattern and so took on the thoughts of that breathing pattern. So they took on the thoughts of that specific popular song. And so he, in his paper that he wrote about this, he obviously talks about using that as obviously a key part of when you're doing therapy, that when you want a client to think about something, you're obviously building rapport with the client and you match the client's breathing and you uh, try to be as like the client as you can be so that you're really in rapport with each other. And then you start saying things in your mind and doing the breathing pattern of those things you're saying so that the client thinks what it is that you're thinking. So they start having those thoughts. Um, so that's kind of one thing. And it, it works the opposite way. As I've said, you can match someone and then you can have it that that person's thoughts almost come up in your own mind because you're letting them lead you and you're just being almost like a receptacle. You're letting them lead you and you're kind of picking up on what they're doing and then you suddenly get the thoughts in your mind that they've got in their mind so there's that then he carried on investigating about communication and one thing that fascinated him was how people who were hard of hearing managed to lip read and what it took to learn to do that and so he had uh, a bunch of people in and he said what do you do and they said it's not really lip reading it's kind of face and neck reading and 
reading the shoulders and reading the breathing and reading the, everything all together. It's not just about what the lips do. It's about the whole sort of thing. And so what he did was an experiment where he had people stood um, sort of there and they're looking at a blackboard there. Oh, sorry to blind you. And the people who are um, hard of hearing are stood near the blackboard or behind the blackboard, if it's like a freestanding blackboard. And they're looking over at the person who's reading off the blackboard. And the role of the people over here is to say what the person over there is reading off of the blackboard and see how accurate they could be. And he found that some people could be incredibly accurate, even though the person, so the person's reading in their own head. The idea is the person's not to move. They're just to stand there, mouth shut, and read what's on the blackboard in their own mind. And he worked out that people were able to do this. And so he started learning how to do that for himself. He started learning, yeah, there are you can watch, uh, and I made a series of videos of this on my other channel years and years ago, where you can watch uh, things like people's lips subtly moving and sort of pursing a little bit and stretching out a little bit and just moving in time with the words they're saying in their head. You can see the same in the throat and the muscles around the throat. And then there's the pulses of air that you can track. So in terms of mentalism and can you really read minds, Technically, there's no kind of psychic mind reading thing that there's research to, to my knowledge, research to evidence that's been peer reviewed and come out as being statistically significant. But you can learn these various techniques to be able to then essentially plant thoughts in people's minds as well as uh, kind of pick up on the thoughts that are in people's minds. And then there are other things that if something's on someone's mind, people are very likely to reveal it by things like the emphasis they give to aspects of their communication. So if someone, uh, so Milton Erickson, uh, again, gives a story about a doctor coming into his office for therapy and this doctor saying, look, I've got a problem, but that's not why I'm here. But I just want to let you know that problem. I'm not going to tell you about it. And said, I don't want you to fish for it. So, you know, just we'll draw a line under it. Uh, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said something, you know, don't, I've, I've got something that I don't want you to know kind of thing. And Erickson kind of said, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, I'm sure you'll reveal it anyway. And then halfway through the session, Erickson picked up his telephone and said to his receptionist outside the room, can you contact so-and-so for me, please? And then he looked at the uh, client and smiled. And the client was like, how did you know that I was having an affair with that member of my staff? And he explained that while the person was talking, they emphasized certain syllables in words that they said that as he pieced them together while he was listening for the pattern, he, he sort of was listening out for the pattern of what this person was doing. And he noticed they emphasize that syllable in that word and that syllable in that word and this syllable in that word. And if you piece it all together, it makes this name. And then they kept repeating it. Every time they would say words that had these syllables in, they would emphasize without, you know, non-consciously these specific syllables from whatever words they were saying. And they were not aware they were doing this. It's just, it. we all do it. It literally is something that we all do. We emphasize things, um, certain words and phrases and what have you and it's related to kind of what's going on for us and what we're really focusing on in our heads while we're doing what we're doing and i find that i do it a lot normally as things like hypnotic suggestions without really realizing it i will uh, even in the lecture i just gave there are things that i said where i gave them as suggestions completely unaware that i did that until i listened to it back and realized i'd said certain things as suggestions to the viewer rather than just directly saying them as I had them written down on uh, on paper. So these things can make people seem psychic, but they're obviously not psychic. Um, mentalism generally is something that's seen as a magic thing. I've obviously got books on mentalism. It's just uh, as in conjuring type magic, uh, predominantly just tricks. Uh, normally, you know something 
somehow beforehand and then you just go through a process of making it look like you're going through a different process to find out that information but you already know the information um i don't know who first started the whole act like a chicken thing but i can imagine that it might have started with it being a cheap and easy thing maybe to do something common that everyone knew what a chicken was um just thinking back to what options people had in the 1800s you didn't have like act like an airplane or um you know whatever else act like a chicken probably was something simple it's not like act like a dog where you'd have to get down maybe on all fours uh, so maybe it was just a convenient thing that made sense at the time in the 1800s and it's kind of stuck um Um, the eye fluttering is, I don't know, it, it's been described in the literature in, in different ways. I, I've kind of questioned whether it's correct what's described. But one thing it's been described at is people experience a little anxiety just before. So it's not so much about the whole trance thing, because obviously, and the REM thing, because you can have that. Um, literally, that's that happens all so frequently through the day without your eyes fluttering um but in relation to it your eyes do generally not for everyone but for a number of people flutter like blink three times fast that's three times fast not three times faster uh blink three times fast just before you know just when you're really responding well and it's something i often look out for because it's so common among people so some people their eyes glaze over and they just keep staring. Their eyes don't flicker at all. They literally just glaze over and are staring into space. And to other people, they may look like they're totally awake and alert and that nothing's happened. They're not in hypnosis or anything. You know, they've not been hypnotized. But you know they are, and you know that they're responding really well to you. It's just that they look perfectly like they did beforehand. It's just they're now perhaps not blinking uh, unless you kind of suggest it or ask them to close their eyes or something. Um, but a lot of people definitely do like a triple blink just before, yeah, just when they really, when it's like almost twigged that they're going, um, and it frequently ends up in like the science literature. So in the books that I've got that are more scientific focused, being talked about it being an anxiety thing that people get that kind of slight anxiety that they're responding or about to respond. But having been hypnotized and known a lot of people who've been hypnotized, I would probably not describe it as anxiety. Because if it is, it definitely you don't have any feeling of anxiety. There's definitely not any anxiety feeling that most people experience at that moment. It's not to say that some people don't, because some people definitely do start feeling a bit anxious, thinking, oh my God, I'm responding here. This is scary. I didn't expect to respond, or whatever it happens to be. That's, you know, there'll always be people who do that. Um but I just think it seems to be definitely associated with some kind of a internal change where someone's suddenly becoming more internally focused, uh, which obviously doesn't have to happen with hypnosis. You could have someone externally focused, but it's it seems to be at that point where they've transitioned to they're now more focused on what's going to be going on in inside them rather than external to them. I'm going to manually try and scroll down. Uh, to change emotional patterns or to change any patterns, it's just trying to look at what the, stim what the pattern is. So not the emotion part, the actual pattern. So what is the stimulus? Um, what emotion is it potentially leading to? And what do you want in its place? depending on the specific emotional situation whatever it the specific problem would significantly change how you might treat it so things with a very strong emotion normally i treat them with something like the rewind technique because it's generally a very good way of having someone calm while kind of having them view the pattern play out from a calm state so that their brain then kind of reconfigures it so you now remember it um some of the thinking on why it works is that it 
makes it so that it now becomes a pattern that's associated with far more of your brain than just um, associated with your amygdala. So rather than it being like a you know, bad thing happens, I respond with fear kind of response or whatever strong emotion is, it becomes something that's now, you know, you've had that pattern play out while you're calm. You've had the pattern play out in many different ways. Um, so it spreads it around your brain, which is also thought to be how many other similar things work and things like EMDR and stuff like that, that it could be that it makes it so that it becomes a whole brain kind of memory rather than just a kind of survival memory. So for stronger emotions, that can be something that does that can be quite an effective way of doing it. For other things, normally mental rehearsal is a good way of uh, going about changing it. So knowing what the stimulus is and then mentally rehearsing an alternative way of having that play out. So from the stimulus, having that trigger a different response and then mentally rehearsing that play out in different contexts and maybe even rehearsing, you know, practicing doing that in the therapy session, depending on what it is you're, you're doing um is often quite a good thing i think what i find is that most people obviously there's always exceptions can focus their attention um on one thing when it interests them so you'll get, for example, people with ADHD who can sit down at a specific computer game for like 15 hours and not budge from that computer game, manage to have that hold their attention or stare at their mobile phone for like 10 hours doing something on their mobile phone. Um, but if something doesn't hold their attention or grab their attention or do whatever it is that's needed. So it could be, for example, say they play that computer game because their attention is only on the computer game, but on the computer game, it's like Call of Duty. And so their attention is constantly darting around and jumping around from moment to moment. So, you know, that's that's kind of like, there are ways that people can hold their attention. It's just because I've had people where teachers have said, this child can't do well in school because they can't focus. And yet, while they're saying this in the meeting, the child is sat in a corner on an iPad, not moving for the entire two hours or something that us adults are talking. And it's like, well, they're playing back then, you know, Angry Birds or whatever it is. So, you know, but they can't hold their attention. It's like, well, Angry Birds is holding their attention, so they can hold their attention. The question is, what can you do to hold their attention? Um, and the number of teachers that have said that they don't feel they should have to change um, what they do to suit one child. I've had so many teachers say that, that why should they have to change their approach just to teach one child? Why should that child be so special when they don't do that for every other child? My view would be that perhaps they should do it, not dramatically, but they should offer different ways of learning for different children. Um, Yeah, uh, irritatingly, uh, to Diddle's point, um, there are so many meditations and things that say they're for autistic people and they're things that are absolutely terrible that you think, I don't think an autistic person was involved in the... It's like, you know, no chickens were harmed in the making of this film. I think no autistic people were involved in the making of this thing for autistic people. Uh, and that kind of irritates me when I see that, especially when I think that is so badly done um, and misses the point so much. Um, in relation to body scans, do certain positions work better than others? Sitting, laying down, how you lay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's what's comfortable for you. So the same with meditation. So meditation in general, I think people end up forcing themselves into uncomfortable positions because they think that that's what they're supposed to do. Um, and then they don't manage to enjoy it or go with the experience. 
um, the most important thing is what is comfortable for you and what is right for you in the context. So, for example, if you were listening to, say, I did a an hour long body scan um, audio track and you thought I'm going to listen to Dan's hour long body scan audio track and you're thinking I'm a little bit tired, but I'm sure I'm fine. If you lay down and listen to that hour long body scan induction audio track, you might fall asleep. If your plan is not to fall asleep, then maybe you want to listen to it sitting up, not lying down. So you end up having to consider these things that it's not just about it's not so much that there's a position that works better than something else. But if you're prone, for example, to falling asleep when listening to something, don't be in a position where you're like, don't be like sitting, uh, lying down on a bed or on a sofa or something, because that's going to just increase the chances that you do fall asleep, which is the thing you don't want to do. Um, if you even fall asleep in a comfortable chair, don't sit on a comfortable chair, sit on an uncomfortable, not an uncomfortable chair, but you know, like an office chair or a dining room chair or something like that, sort of a hardback chair, just put like a towel on the back of it or whatever, just to make yourself comfortable, because you don't want to actually get pain from it. But something that a large part of your brain is going to be thinking, I've got to hold position because if I fall asleep here, I'm obviously just going to fall off. So you've got to kind of hold yourself in some level of position. Um, the other one is obviously if you listen to things and they're prone to falling asleep, then listen to things like inductions or processes that involve a lot of interactivity so that you are actively engaged in what's going on which again is then going to reduce the chances of you falling asleep to it. Whereas if you perhaps want to fall asleep, then listening to something where it's got enough activity, engagement, engaging activity to stop you focusing on your thoughts. So there are questions asked of you like, what does your left hand feel like? What does your right hand feel like? What does your chest feel like? Notice what your legs feel like. You know, there's enough questions to keep your attention. That, oh, right, I'll focus on that. I'll focus on that. I'll focus on that. I'll focus on that. Rather than, you know, just listen, have my voice in the background, for example. And while my voice is in the background, you're actually talking to yourself in your head and going off somewhere completely different and not engaging. So if you're someone that worries or anything like that, make sure there's enough to engage with. But kind of get that balance right. Um, with what the set setting is so do you want to fall asleep do you want to stay awake length can come into that if it if you don't want to fall asleep use something that's no longer than about 20 to 25 minutes if you do want to fall asleep perhaps have something a bit longer uh this is like daytime so nighttime if you're actually tired you'll probably fall asleep even if it's unless you're a real big warrior you'll probably fall asleep even if it's like 10 15 minutes long um i'll ignore the who is milton what's his name thing uh darren does what he does in many different ways uh some of it is literally just magic tricks so for example he'll say um he'll do some kind of a normal magic trick to work out the num to get the number given to him beforehand uh, you know, before what you, before what you perceive as the trick, say you're watching him live. So before what you perceive as the trick, he'll figure out a way of getting that number. So it could be, he'll say, just write it down on a bit of paper and just put that in your, so he'll give you a pad, you know, write it down on a bit of paper, put that in your pocket um, in case we need to show the audience kind of at the end to prove that I'm correct or whatever it happens to be. So you then write it on the pad, tear off the bit of paper, fold it up, hand back the pad, put it in your pocket. He will know from the indentation perhaps on the pad what it is that you've written on the paper, or there'll be some other way of him knowing. So maybe it's got carbon paper underneath. And so just as he's putting it in his pocket and faffing a bit, he can lift the page up slightly and see the carbon copy of the number on the page underneath the one you wrote on or whatever it happens to be. You know, there's lots of ways that people can do that. Um, and there's lots of other things he can do as well and ways of getting even more complicated information so sometimes it's literally just um some kind of a trick where 
he now will go through a process of, you know, say that number over in your mind, say it over and over again. Are you thinking of nine or whatever it happens to be? He already knows that because you wrote it down and he saw what you wrote down. And so he knows what you wrote down. And so his, I'm going to try and work it out. I can see that there's a kind of nah, nah, kind of sound out of your mouth and, uh, and he'll make, say all these different things, but actually he, he's just making a show rather than saying, right, nine, right, next one. Yeah, rather than just making it quite boring. Um, sometimes he will put the number into your mind uh, or the card or whatever. So, for example, if you've got his book, which you probably don't, uh, Pure Effect, um, there's tricks like his card trick where he says, uh, just picture a card in your mind and um, just imagine the uh, you know, the number sort of you know, up there and sort of down here and the, um, you know, the sort of pips, the sort of d -d 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 down the middle of the, the, the card. You know, the, so just picture that in your mind there. And then he'll say, you're thinking of the three of diamonds. And obviously he was drawing a three up here and drawing a three down here. And he was doing the three dots down the middle, the sort of pip, pip, pip. And he was then sort of saying, just pitch that in your mind. And when he does it, it would be sort of, yeah, pitch that in your mind. So what you want is that TV screen in, in your mind. And, and on that screen, so do three diamonds down the middle. And so he's kind of putting you in an uncertain position where you're just kind of very responsive. He's got you up in, on stage and he's got you kind of trying to essentially hypnotized you know you're, you're sort of on edge waiting to respond to whatever it is he's doing and being you know in that sort of hyper responsive state and his communication you then understand it better because you're in that hyper responsive i need a, an answer i need an escape from the confusion of being on stage with darren brown kind of state and then you see the three there and the three there and the three dots down the middle and the the three uh, diamonds drawn in the sky and um, and his talking about the pip, pip, pip down the middle and, and you seal that without really thinking about it and then you suddenly think of that card. And there are lots of other ones like, um, you know, he would do sort of, you know, just draw something large in your mind, uh, kind of on a big screen and he'd sort of do seven of hearts and someone who's in a responsive state who's, Kind of in that confused i don't know what i'm doing i just have to go with the flow and follow the lead of darren kind of thing is then hyper responsive to that and is then more likely to write down the seven of hearts or pick the seven of hearts um so there's lots of different ways that he would do that and i think he does also uh, at times read a bit of the throat and and obviously have trained to do a bit of that but you generally try especially if you're doing magic shows and find ways of making sure you are very, very confident of the information without having to actually read someone's mind, so to speak. Um, ideally, you want to know what the answer is before you start the trick. Um, try and scroll. Can't stop hypno downing, apparently. Obviously, uh, what you're trying to do with hypnosis is narrow someone's focus of attention. So that's why obviously focusing on one thing works as an induction, because if someone's focusing on one spot, their attention, you know, you say, find a spot above eye level and look at that spot. And so someone stares up at that spot. And then for a start, they've now followed what you're saying. So they're being responsive, which is good. Uh, so, that, you know, they're staring at that spot and you then ask them to notice what it looks like, uh, what the texture there is, what it, what sounds they can hear, and you get them to focus on being in the moment and looking at that spot, and that narrows their focus of attention. And obviously the whole point of what you're trying to do is narrow their focus of attention in relation to you, but obviously here you're doing it on the spot, but they're following along to you. So it's just that process of narrowing their focus of attention in the same way that you could, um, th there's lots of ways you can distract someone, uh, whether it's things like the push down on my hand induction, where you're creating a sense of confusion. You tell someone to push harder and harder and harder and keep pushing harder and harder. And they go into their head and think, I can't push any harder. What's he doing asking me to push harder? And at that moment, they've gone into their head 
and they're in that state of confusion, they're looking for clarity, they're primed to want to focus on something, you know, want to have an escape to the clarity. So you then say sleep, pull your hand away, and then obviously they, if they're willing to go along with it, they then go along with it, and you then have given them a solid suggestion that they can follow, so a solid escape from the confusion, one solid escape route. Um, so any hypnotic induction, the whole point of it is literally just to have a way of focusing attention. It doesn't matter what you use. It could be, I've got a pen thing here. So it could be that I just sort of get out a pen and, and I start kind of slowly moving it around in a way in front of someone that I see their eyes drawn to it and I see that they're focusing on it. And then I just kind of change the speed of the moving to start changing you know, to gain that responsiveness. So initially they're just kind of distracted a bit by it and then they start paying more attention to it. And as I slow it down, it now becomes something more kind of enticing. And when I see that this is happening, I see that they're beginning to respond more to it. And so I might then do more lower downward movements to get them to close their eyes if I wanted to use the pen as a suggestion object. So I want to suggest something by moving the pen. Um, if someone smokes, you could just talk to them about smoking and have them uh, focusing on what it's like to smoke a cigarette or whatever they smoke and use that as the induction. Solution focused therapy, obviously the whole aim of it is you're essentially doing hypnosis. You're asking someone to focus on a specific, say you do the miracle question. You ask someone to focus on, you know, if you woke up in the morning and a miracle had happened during the night, and your problem's no longer there, how will you know? What will be the first thing you notice? And then the client's like, well, the first thing I'd notice, I'd get out of bed and I'd probably take a deep breath and think, wow, I feel great. Okay, and after you've taken that deep breath and you think, wow, I feel great, what happens next? Tell me. And then the person would be like, well, I, I'll leave my bedroom and I often go downstairs and I go and put the kettle on ready to make a cup of tea. Okay, and after you've put the kettle on, what do you do then? And you talk a bit softer so you don't intrude on their kind of reminiscing or you know future viewing this future that's happening. And so you're, you've narrowed their attention onto this potential future of theirs that they then follow and guide themselves through. And obviously the way I'm wording this, uh, I'm not teaching about solution focus working at this exact moment in time, but the way I'm wording this is very specific that I'm saying after that, what will happen when that happens, what happens next. So I'm wording everything as if this is 100% possible and going to happen. And they're telling me this will then happen. This will then happen. So they're giving themselves, I'm using suggestions to imply a future of these things being real. They're giving themselves the post-hypnotic suggestion of this is going to be real in my future. And so obviously you're creating the situation where you're making it more likely that this potential future will end up taking place but at the same time you're doing hypnosis you've narrowed their focus of attention and as you keep going doing this they become more drawn into it and more absorbed in it and more responsive to what you then say next and what you then say after that um Uh, I don't know the disease name. I do know that some people blink when they lie, but then others blink when they don't want to face up to something. So there's lots of reasons why obviously people blink, but uh, you know, some people blink because of light. Um, but in relation to psychological things, it's quite common that when someone doesn't want to face up to something, they end up blinking. When people are thinking of, not necessarily a lie, but when they're making something up or really hunting for how to say something so i'm trying hard here to avoid saying that the person is lying because the person is not necessarily lying and this is where the flaw happens that people can sometimes go on courses and learn ah oh, people do this when they lie so if i see it it means they're lying and it doesn't necessarily always mean that so if someone's doing a lot of processing in their mind and you'll see me do it when i'm when i do the live sleep story creation sessions not that i've done one for ages but uh, you'll see me close my eyes or blink extra. I can't fake it, but you know, blink extra because I'm trying to go in my mind 
and process, okay, what am I going to say next? How am I going to say what I'm going to say next? So I kind of have a general idea of where I want to go, but I want to use specific words to say that. So sometimes it's not that someone's lying. It's that someone's trying to think, for example, how do I say this without offending this person who I'm talking to? Or how do I best say this to impress this interviewer? Or whatever it happens to be. Sometimes it's that you're trying so hard to quickly come up with how to say something that the blinking isn't that you're necessarily lying. It's that you're trying to do a lot of processing in your mind and that takes a lot of effort. And so you keep shutting off from external reality uh, for periods of time. Uh, the rewind technique is a kind of technique of, I don't know how to explain it. It's a technique uh, that's based on an old NLP technique called the visual kinesthetic um, technique or the fast phobia cure. But it's something that works for obviously PTSD. It works for removing any strong emotion. It works for things like uh, cravings, for example, as well. So it's, it works for a lot of different things. Uh, it was called the rewind technique by a couple of different people. Uh, David Muss, I think his name is. I'm sure someone will correct me. Um, came up with the name of the rewind technique for what he does. But then at the same kind of time, the Human Givens Foundation came up with which was human givens college at that point um or minefields college at that point i think came up with the rewind technique as a name as well for their version and then there was these two kind of versions of the rewind technique one by uh psychologists one by i think a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist one ended up getting uh some papers about it uh he submitted you know peer-reviewed papers and things, which is quite cool, um, about how effective this technique is. Um, and the idea is that it's kind of a process of being detached from the thing that causes you, uh, so it uses dissociation, you're detached from the thing that causes you that negative emotion or whatever emotion you're trying to remove. So let's think for an example. Say you had a fear of heights you would see yourself watching yourself in the situation where or in the worst or the first and sometimes you normally do more than one example but you normally start with the worst or the first sometimes you can't remember the first so you name just go with the worst and the worst few um situation of that fear happening in your past so you're watching you watching that situation unfold so you're not watching the situation unfold in your mind you're calmly watching you watching the situation and so that's already your brain knows that it's thinking about the situation it's processing the situation but in your mind you're not actually there's no sensory experience of that you're watching you watching the situation then you go into the movie and experience that situation, the negative thing in reverse, which is where it get, got its name, the rewind technique. So you then experience it in reverse from a point after it happened. So long, it could be long after it happened or whenever. It doesn't have to be a real point. It's just a point in time that the video can start where there's no problem taking place. So there's no reason for anxiety or anything in that po static point on the video. And then it goes all the way back with somewhere in the middle is the problem, you know, that sort of bad thing, all the way back to a point at some point before it happened where there was no reason to be anxious or anything because there was no knowledge or awareness that it was ever going to happen in the future. So you've got these two safe points almost, and you rewind back through it really, really, really fast, taking about a second to go back to the beginning. And then from that paused point at the beginning, you go back into the you watching the screen and you then watch it in fast forward from the beginning to the end again taking about a second to watch it from the beginning to end so it flashes past really quickly in your mind again having it as a calm point at the beginning a calm point at the end all the way through and then you imagine going into the screen again going in reverse again through it back out again watching it forward 
again, fast, faster each time, go back into it, reverse back again, come out, watch it again, go back into it, reverse back. So you're always scrambling the pattern, which is something that happens. So whenever you actually are experiencing the pattern, you're scrambling it because you're going backwards through it. And when you're, whenever you're observing it, it's technically scrambled. Uh, it's going fast. So the pattern's still broken. It's not going at the normal speed. It's not going how it's used to go. And so you watch it doing that. And then after doing this a bunch of times, you can watch it at whatever speed you're comfortable watching and rate it, see how you feel. And if there's still any anxiety there, then you might do some run throughs on some more memories from the past. It normally takes not that long, seven minutes ish per round of doing this. And then once the person's very comfortable with the past stuff, then you imagine that screen disappear off into the distance, maybe explode something that I normally do things like that because it just gives that sense of finality. Like it can't come back because it's destroyed into millions of pieces. And then you imagine a new TV coming up, which has all the responses of how they want to respond in the future instead of that old way of responding. And this future one, you've obviously in your session prior to doing the rewind technique, you've already talked about, so what's the problem? You've addressed all of that. What is, how would you like to respond instead? And you've already covered the ideal way. So you, you're guiding them through the, the ideal way of responding because they've told you this is the ideal way, this is how I want to do it. So they then watch themselves doing everything how they want it to play out in the future instead. And then they start the video again. They go into the screen and they do some mental rehearsal of, OK, now experience going through that again, over and over again, uh, with it going how you want it to go. So that then the only pattern that isn't scrambled is the good pattern, is the one of how they want to respond. The bad pattern was scrambled, jumbled up, you know, reversed, fast forwarded, made very, 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 very fast, detached from it uh, whenever it's going forward, associated into it when it was going backwards. Um, you can throw in things like funny talking because everything's going fast and in a high pitched reverse voice or a high pitched forward voice or whatever. Um, so essentially, you're just making it so that it's hard to access the old way of responding and you've kind of made it so that the whole brain is now involved in this thing and not just uh the initial you know there's a stimulus i panic i have no conscious control over it kind of thing there's now this added element of this is no longer that instinctive unconscious response um generally i would say that to do the whole process takes including the mental rehearsal about 20 to 25 minutes or so um so that's the technique um and you might do it over a number of sessions so you might sort of have the person come back and say there's this extra bit of problem sometimes you won't do the mental rehearsal bit so for example say someone has been abused or something they don't want to mentally rehearse being abused again um, so you're not going to obviously have them mentally rehearse being abused again um, but what they might mentally rehearse is things that the abuse has had an effect on. So for example, one person I worked with, one big effect that um, it had on them, they'd been abused. And so when their first boyfriend, who they were with, touched them, just like on the shoulder, just sort of, oh, hi, and just would touch them. They would literally, they knew martial arts, they literally would just grab the person and throw them to the floor in an instinctive, you're trying to attack me kind of way. So what they ended up mentally rehearsing was, you know, imagining yourself sitting on a bench, overlooking, you know, the environment that they described where they'd have a nice bench to sit on. And imagine that your boyfriend comes over and you, you hear him approaching and then he touches you on the shoulder and he greets you and you know, he's here or whatever. And you feel that flood of uh, love for him as he touches you on the shoulder like that or whatever. I can't remember what, exactly what it was, but it was stuff we had discussed that she would prefer to be her way of responding. We then covered that during the mental rehearsal so that, you know, that was the stuff that needed rehearsing. Um, with an agoraphobic who I worked with, who I've talked about a lot, 
within 20 minutes or so half an hour of the start of the session we were sat on uh you know she for like 15 years had never gone outside the front or back of her house she could get to the porch on the back uh, outside the back door but then would panic and have to go in and close the door she couldn't even get outside the front door of her house and 30 minutes later we were sat on bogner seafront eating ice cream talking about how life can be different now that she can go outside but we still had to have a load of sessions because the world had changed a lot in 15 years this was a long time ago so the 15 years started in the 1990s mobile phones had come in uh card payments that weren't like the scan across type things had come in using chip and pin and stuff like that um so much had changed in that 15 year period that you know she'd not driven her car for 15 years so we had to have sessions around these other areas around helping her to get used to different areas of life and had a session where for example i don't drive but where i sat in the back seat of her car while she drove with a good friend of hers in the front seat front passenger seat that could uh, you know take over the driving if there was any problems um so we had to go out for a drive for a bit and uh you know a bit of a chat while we're driving and um you know sort of putting over somewhere and seeing how she's getting on with that so you know there's lots of other therapy you might have to do around it um but yeah that's the the technique you can translate the meditations and the person had written autism books Yeah, abusers frequently will use double binds, as will others who, like managers who try and control you and put blame on you and stuff. Yep, yeah, sometimes being uncomfortable can be the thing that helps you to focus and helps you not to just fall asleep or something or get too comfortable. Hopefully I am catching up with your questions. Apparently there's one at the start of the stream. I don't think I saw that by the time I got on here. Okay, my little bar has uh, shown lots of space beneath it. So I'm not as near the bottom as I thought. Yep, there are ways that someone can know someone's pin number including uh having a look earlier in the night um just taking their wallet out of their coat or something having a quick look and then putting it back uh, my uncle used to do things like that this is pre things like pin number days uh, no that's the card number wouldn't it be yeah pin number I'm trying to think how you do that you can have someone write it down uh, you can also say things that if someone if something's very emotional so yeah sorry i was thinking of card number yeah if someone was was emotional about not revealing something again you would see their response when it looks like you're close um hopefully i won't be scrolling for 10 minutes i'm trying to give shorter answers um there are lots of ways that ericsson i'm sure was wrong um largely because things have moved on uh one thing ericsson was relatively famous for was that he had an idealized view of how things should go so nearly every case study i don't know how true it was in relation to his actual cases but every case study he would recount would end with and then she met her partner settled down they had two kids and lived happily ever after and nearly every single one of Ericsson's cases had that kind of ending. Um, some things Ericsson was wrong about were, for example, um, you know, looking into trying to cure people of being gay and like what the psychological, whether you could use hypnosis to do that, what the psychological things were there and thinking about it in those terms. Um, he kind of uh, at one point was interested in 
I think it was Jay Haley's views of um, a double bind theory of schizophrenia. So I don't know how kind of solidly he was interested in that, but uh, that again was wrong uh, to do with parenting where uh, it, it's kind of an approach of a parent saying, um, come here, slap kind of thing, you know, a kind of, I love you whack causes the double bind, uh, you know, that sort of double bind parenting of you think you're loved and so you go to embrace your parent and then they hit you and they don't actually give you the love you're after, but then they do the same again and again and again. And so you end up with this kind of alternative, uh, like it, it sort of, the thinking was it kind of breaks your brain a bit. Um, but yeah, I've spoken about things that I think are differing opinions uh, of where Ericsson was likely wrong. Um, Ericsson's view was, but there's some things where it wasn't, there's some things where Ericsson was less wrong than a lot of his followers who latched onto aspects of what he did and then ran with that as if that's the way to do things. Um, so, for example, uh, there are people who will say indirect working is more effective than direct working and they'll do everything they can to be indirect all the time rather than just directly telling people things. And obviously the research is that that is complete rubbish. Uh, there's indirect suggestion isn't more effective than direct suggestion. A suggestion. The suggestions are as effective as each other, but generally when you're indirect, you're more likely to actually have people less responsive because people don't trust you because you're always beating around the bush. Um, so there's a great paper, I can't remember the name of it now, there's a great paper specifically on that on how good Ericsson was as a uh, clinician, but how the focus on things like, you know, people saying working indirectly is more effective than directly, etc. That's complete rubbish. Um, so there's lots of things where people have picked certain aspects of what Ericsson did, and then they've gone and uh, tried to make that like, like, for example, the unconscious thing. Ericsson would use the term unconscious, uh, an unconscious mind. But at the same time in Ericsson's writing, he also does say that he's not talking about an unconscious mind in terms of a separate entity that's all knowing, that's in your brain, that's separate from the conscious mind. Um, but at the same time, he talked in a way as if that was. And so I can understand that that becomes confusing because then you think, well, did he at one point believe that it was and then another point believe it wasn't? and um, Or is it just down to because he also did a lot of talking to people in their own language and in in ways that they would understand from their perspective um so then it's a question of is that what he was then doing talking to people in ways that they just understand because it's how they understand things um but i did when i had my uh, facebook hypnotherapy group i shared a thing saying that there is no such thing as an unconscious mind and instantly got loads of comments of you're not an Ericksonian then you're not a true Ericksonian you're you you know uh, you've got to believe that there's an unconscious mind that's like fundamental to the Ericksonian approach and obviously I was like well that's not what matches with actual science so you know even if Erickson did believe there was an unconscious mind as a separate entity in people's brains which I don't think he did um I would then disagree because that isn't what science shows. Uh, and that doesn't make me any lesser an Ericksonian. It makes me someone who moves with the science rather than being rigid in the 1970s or 1980, if I go up all the way up to when Ericsson died, you know, rather than being rigid with something that was taught in one, yeah, you know, up to one point in time and saying, I'm never moving with the times, despite technology moving on and advances in knowledge and stuff, I'm sticking with what's old um that's not the way to be as a therapist so uh there have been videos where i've covered more i can't remember off the top of my head but videos where i've covered more about things that i think ericsson was wrong about and things that ericsson like for example ericsson's things of trying to get people to do things wrong 
uh, sort of immoral things. Part of the thinking is that maybe he had less success because his belief was that it shouldn't be hypnosis shouldn't be used that way. And so because people are more responsive under hypnosis, he's obviously communicating whether he wants to or not his belief that he shouldn't be using hypnosis in that way and that people should obviously respond by not doing these things. He should find the result of it can't be used that way. Um, so there is some sort of thinking that, uh, and this is something that uh, George Estabrooks uh, felt that Ericsson was probably doing a lot of um, conveying information non-consciously that the clients were then picking up on. Um, about not responding. Right, I'm going to try and scroll further. Yeah, I do have demonstrations of it and a course teaching it, uh, an e-course teaching the rewind technique. That's as far as I've got. Uh, do hypnotherapists need to be psychologists, psychiatrists, or can people without a career uh, do that as long as they study hypnotherapy? This is a kind of, this will depend where you are in the world. So some countries i know will only let uh, psychologists or psychiatrists work therapeutically with people uh, psychologically therapeutically with people uh, so take the hypnotherapy part out of it so that means that if someone were to work psychologically with someone with whatever problems they've got and they wanted to use hypnosis as a part of that treatment then in those countries it would have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist because that's the laws in those countries um, i can't think of which ones off the top of my head um, i think israel might be one of them i can't remember um, there's one i encountered uh, where someone asked me if i could do a remote session with them it's going back a lot of years now, a remote session with them. And uh, I couldn't because when I looked at the laws for their country, you fell under, even as the remote person and me in the UK, I fell under the country's laws. And so that meant that if I did it, I was then breaking the country's laws and would have to face the country's laws uh, consequences if I was found out. Um, quite slim that I'd get found out, but yeah, it could have happened. And for example, with the US, not only is you know with the us it's more complicated because different states have different rules as well and so there are some places where technically if i were to do a remote session with someone in one us state i'm under the laws of that state because i am doing therapy with some so the law is around the person on the receiving end of the therapy and then other states have it where the law is around the person doing the therapy so that would mean that I'm then under British laws, not um, the US laws in whatever state. So all of these things obviously get a bit confusing. And then again, most places in the US, as far as I'm aware, allow you to practice as a hypnotist and not call yourself necessarily a hypnotherapist, that you're not allowed to treat psychological conditions so you can't treat anxiety you can't treat you can't say you treat anxiety depression uh, you know phobias uh, post-traumatic stress disorder etc you can't say you treat any clinical condition if you're just a uh, hypnotist you have to be a psychologist or psychiatrist to treat those problems um or I think social work or whatever, whatever the different professional qualifications happen to be. So whereas in the UK, literally you can decide, you know, you could be working in McDonald's, 
And then you can say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of working in McDonald's tomorrow. I'm going to be a hypnotherapist. And now you can practice as a hypnotherapist. You probably won't get insurance as a hypnotherapist if that's all you've done and you've not got a single qualification. But technically, that's all you need to do to then practice as a hypnotherapist. Um, so the law is a very, you know, the sort of situation is a very complicated one. Um, my view is so hypnosis itself is not a therapy. That's obviously an enormously important point that I think people seem to misunderstand or overlook. Um, that's quite a sort of irritating point because it's so important. People say, can hypnosis help me with X, Y, and Z? But hypnosis is not a therapy. So what they should be saying is, can know, cognitive behavioral therapy help me with X, Y, and Z? Can um, this form of therapy help me? Hypnosis itself is not a therapy. So someone studying to be a hypnotherapist, as I say, in the UK at least, it's a stupid situation where literally you could just say one day, tomorrow I'm going to be a hypnotherapist, and you can then be a hypnotherapist. And there's no law to say that you're doing something wrong. Um, there are advised guidelines um, that are done through the Complementary National Health Care Council, I think it is, uh, that uh, this is what we expect a hypnotherapist to be trained up to, what level we expect them to be trained up to, and what we expect of them as a hypnotherapist. But it's kind of just guidelines. It's not an official legal thing that anyone has to follow. So, for example, my very first ever hypnotherapy qualification as a hypnotherapist was back in 2001 so i've been doing hypnosis since i was 14 or so 13 14 years old and then i ended up in a relationship with somebody who was kind of scared of the whole hypnosis thing so while i was in a relationship with her i didn't really do i did a lot with graham uh, my best friend but i didn't actually actively pursue anything to do with hypnosis beyond just practicing stuff and reading lots of stuff um, and obviously watching lots of stuff. And I was working in mental health from like the 90s uh, through to sort of, I don't know, the early 2000s before I moved into working with children and families. And um, so I had experience working in mental health. I was initially training as a psychiatric nurse back then uh, in like 97, 98. Then myself and that person, we separated. And so I instantly, one of the first things I did was dived into, right, I'm going to qualify as a hypnotherapist specifically so that I can then work seeing clients. And I, at that point, this is 2001, thought, right, I'm going to have to, you know, to be a hypnotherapist, you, you must have to have a qualification. And so I went to a local company that said we'd you know, teach hypnotherapy, clinical hypnotherapy diploma. It was a two day course. Uh, I went on the two day course. It taught absolute rubbish. It, it gave me a folder with about a dozen scripts in. They said, that's all you'll ever need. You've got a dozen scripts for the main things like smoking, anxiety, uh, PTSD, phobias, all, all sort of main things you might encounter. There's a script for it. Just read the script and there's a bunch of it like 10 inductions or something very slow kind of you know focus on the spot on the wall um count down go downstairs uh walk into a garden um walk along a seafront um body scan inductions the, the kind of sort of basic inductions um so i took that training and it accredited me as being a clinical hypnotherapist for two days training, I was able to, if I wanted, I didn't, but I was able to join, I think it's the American Board of Hypnotherapy or something like that, um, which I obviously didn't join. And I was able to get insurance to be a hypnotherapist. You know, they sort of gave the sort of, here's a form for an insurance company that will insure people who've done this training. So I was able to do that as well. 
So my first hypnotherapy course was literally one that I knew a lot more than I than was covered on that course that was saying it qualified me with a diploma as a clinical hypnotherapist. Um, it gave me no real training about anything. It literally just was two days of here's what hypnosis is. Read these scripts to each other to practice and then go home. You're now qualified. Um, that to me, I wouldn't want to go to any person who's only trained to that level and i would actively advise anyone who knows of people trained to that level not to go to those people because they're clearly significantly under trained um to deal with emotional problems that can be quite complex at times and have a lot more to them even when they appear simple on the surface um other diplomas i've done took like my favorite one was my one with uncommon knowledge, which I feel is the most comprehensive. You have to do two hypnotherapy training weekends before you're allowed to attend. They don't run the diploma anymore, but uh, you had to do two hypnotherapy training weekends before you were allowed to apply to attend the hypnotherapy diploma course. The hypnotherapy diploma course was a whole year of training. So you'd done the two weekends before that, and then you do a whole year of training after that um and that whole year you pretty much don't cover hypnosis for the rest of the year because it doesn't take any effort to learn hypnosis hypnosis is obviously so ridiculously easy to learn that you've learned the hypnosis on day one of the training course that you took the other days were just building on what you were learning learning a few therapeutic techniques to go with the hypnosis you'd learned uh, and learning a bit more about things like language patterns and working with people who perhaps are maybe a little bit more resistant or a bit more like they don't respond exactly as you would expect them to um, obviously on training courses people generally respond to each other exactly as you would expect them to because you're all compliant and you're all trying to learn together uh, but real life is that some people are a bit nervous and so they don't respond quite so well and other people are there because their partner has said they've got to be there not because they want to be there so they then don't engage and respond quite so well so there was some training around those kind of things um but once you got to the year diploma part there was no need to teach the hypnosis part because you already know it you've done your four days of training of hypnosis you don't need more training on hypnosis you just need to be applying it as part of the sort of therapeutic work you do and then across that year, you had four, I think it was, live client sessions where you would have, and it was observed, so you'd have a day four times a year where you would uh, have like four of you going, so four students across the day and an instructor with you. And you would have, you'd be told, right, your client is arriving at, say, 9.15 in the morning. So you've got to go to the university entrance at 9.15, meet your client. You're not allowed to talk to them about why they're there or anything. You can have small talk about the weather and where they come from and whether the drive was okay or whatever, but you're not allowed to start therapy early, so to speak. Um, and so you then walk with that client to the room that you're going to be doing the session in. You then, as soon as they sit down and you sit down, you then start your session do your therapy session with them for an hour and at the end of that hour you've got three students who through the day are going to also be doing the same as you three students watching you do your therapy session and an instructor watching you do your therapy session the instructor's marking your session and you've got four sessions across the year and if you fail any of the sessions you fail the diploma you don't get your qualification um so you you obviously want to pass your sessions but the sessions start from i think about two months in three months in so you've not necessarily covered it, all the information so you might get a, a client who says i'm deeply depressed and suicidal and it's your first client of the course and yet the course on depression may not be for another two months the bit that covers depression so you may know nothing about depression, really, other than some basics that you've been learning, but you may not have covered it in like in detail as a, an, an actual unit. 
and yet you've got a depression client sat in front of you and the idea is it doesn't matter you've just got to do the best you can you then afterwards have to write up what you did and why you did what you did what you didn't do why you didn't do what you didn't do what you could have done and perhaps why you didn't do what you could have done like say you ran out of time or whatever uh, what maybe you could have done but you haven't didn't think about so you have to show that you understand everything that you were doing and that you didn't do mistakes you perhaps made you have to talk about them so you write all of that down you have to write a whole report about it all the instructor who watched you they write a report as well they then obviously uh, read your report that tells them how much you understood or didn't understand what was going on and then they grade you on that session uh, and whether you passed that session with that client whether you passed it or not um and obviously if you fail any session that's instantly failure of the course and you get one chance after the end of the course to retry one session so if you fail more than one session that's it but if you fail just one of your four sessions you get an opportunity to retry the session um and fail doesn't mean you know you didn't manage to help the client it means you didn't manage to do therapy to the appropriate standard with that client so the expectation on you as a therapist isn't that that client is going to necessarily be healed instantly because of your wonderful therapy in that session it's that you're doing therapy as you should be doing as a, a professional therapist that's kind of the standard they want you to be at and then obviously the course also includes a summer exam and an end of course exam that you have to take and pass as well and the exam uh, doesn't make up as many points as the sessions do but you could fail the course if you know you didn't get enough points from the exam as well um, and you have to do a logbook to show how you're practicing and applying hypnosis throughout the whole year and then that logbook gets looked at in the summer to make sure that you're doing it and make sure you know to see what you've been doing how you've been practicing how you've been showing that you understand what research you've been doing what books you've been reading how you've been understanding those books to make sure you've been reading all the reading material perhaps ideally if you're dan you've read all of the recommended reading material as well as all of the essential reading material um and lots of other material on top of that so you have to do all of that that gets marked in the summer and then again at the end of the course uh, so there's so much more involved in that course and the whole focus of the entire course was to teach therapy it was to teach about solution focused therapy motivational interviewing uh systemic therapy um it was to teach uh a heavy focus on treating anxiety and anxiety 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 disorders depression those kind of things and which include like phobias post-traumatic stress disorder uh ocd and then um there was also focus on things like family therapy and stuff as well so the idea was that the whole course is about teaching therapy and therapeutic approaches and solution focused therapy was there as well uh therapy and therapeutic approaches not about teaching hypnosis because you learned the hypnosis beforehand you don't need to be learning the hypnosis on the course and because hypnosis isn't therapy the idea is that you're using the hypnosis with the therapy so any uh so this has been a very long answer and i probably am going to be scrolling for hours now um so in answer to that question um so you could go straight into a career of just being a hypnotherapist literally you could just decide it one day if you're in the uk in america it's probably different and it might depend what you call yourself and what you say you do like whether you do coaching or therapy for example um but on top of that i don't even if you can it isn't right if you don't have clinical experience and the course you take if you're just taking say a hypnotherapy course because you want the quickest way to have a qualification so that you can call yourself a hypnotherapist and start practicing and you don't plan on doing further uh you know continue professional development or anything you just literally want a bit of paper that says um you're now able to be a hypnotherapist and then that's it 
And I know a lot of people like that, where that literally is the end of their journey. They don't want to read books. They don't want to study more. They just want a bit of paper that lets them charge £100 an hour to a client. And that's it. They don't want more than that. Um, they don't want to know how to treat different problems. They just want a bunch of scripts and they'll read the scripts. And if it doesn't work, it's the client's fault for not responding and they'll move on. And obviously that's something that I very strongly disagree with. And I think that the important thing is whether you're allowed to in your given country or not, it's about being ethical and making sure your focus is on knowing about doing therapy and hypnosis is going to be, if you want to use it, an adjunct to the therapy, a part of the therapy, something you're using to help your therapy be more effective. I would strongly recommend, for example, that if someone wanted to get into being a hypnotherapist or any form of therapist, go and get a job working within social services if you want to focus on things like family therapy or working with children or whatever like that. Go and get a job working for mental health charities or working within mental health in some context or in even in mental health care homes if you want to get an easy kind of way in that doesn't necessarily require uh, any advanced skills or I think it does involve skills but you know like academic -y things think you don't you can normally just turn up and say I want a job and they'll say they're looking for a low skilled person um, so get work in the therapy kind of field do a lot of train take every training course your job offers you so if your job offers you training around different things for example when I worked in a children's home helping to set up the therapeutic children's home they sent me um, on a university course to learn about psychodynamic therapy. I would never use anything from it, um, but that's the approach that they advocated. So that's what I was learning there. Um, in one of my other jobs, they, I, was, I got the job because I was already solution focused trained, but they obviously wanted me to then attend more courses on as part of the job. Uh, and continue professional development on solution focused therapy, motivational interviewing and all these kind of things. So obviously I jumped at the chance of taking all these courses. I also, as part of the job, would have observed sessions to make sure I was doing my job correctly. And I'd have clinical supervision as part of the job. So all of this helps you to then, if you want to work privately, it helps you to then gain even further skills and knowledge that you can then apply, not just like I was a computer, worker you know i just sat on a computer all day and now i'm going to be a therapist working with people having no knowledge really of people and i'm just going to read scripts to them or something um so i think you know it's helpful to get jobs in that area first before you make a jump to doing it like self-employed or something um the rewind technique may or may not work with the sound issue. It would depend exactly on what it is, because it has to be something that can be changed. It has to be something that has a clear cause to it uh, that's causing the anxiety, uh, not just a loud sound causes it. Um, and it would have to be something that isn't just an instinctive kind of inbuilt response that you, know, you should have. Um, Next few comments are saying what I just said. I have done videos on the rewind technique uh, and demonstrations and stuff. Uh, I have, I'm just seeing if I'm at the bottom, I may be at the bottom. Um, I have used hypnosis in relation to Tourette's uh, with a couple of people and with other similar, um, so similar as in tick based uh, things. Um, it's work no different to doing any other therapy that you're asking the person when does the problem happen the most when does it happen the least 
Uh, when does it happen when you would expect it not to happen? When doesn't it happen when you would expect it to happen? So you're finding out the pattern of the problem uh, and then you're just working with that. So if someone says, oh, the Tourette's doesn't have, you know, the sort of ticks or whatever specific bits you're talking about, uh, doesn't happen so much when I'm relaxed or doesn't happen so much when I'm focused, which obviously can be two different things. Um, sometimes it can happen more when someone's relaxed, but when they're focused, like on reading or something, it doesn't really happen. So it would depend, you know, these are different things. Um, so someone would then tell you when it happens and how it happens and when it doesn't happen. And you would then just help the person to focus on building the time when it doesn't happen up to being a more predominant time. Um, so, for example, someone who I worked with in, I think, 2012 or something, 2011, maybe a bit before that, uh, they had essential tremors. And essential tremors is incurable. It only gets worse as the person gets older and it ends up significantly negatively impacting their life because they would, uh, you know, shake. And so that can affect their driving or whatever. Um, and it's often the tongue tremors and that can then make them stutter and affect the ability to speak and hold conversations and what have you. And so they came to me, they, they knew me, uh, they're a work colleague of mine and they said, you know, I've got this diagnosis and I've got these experiences that I have. I struggle with their one was their tongue. They said, I don't have too many problems with the hands or anything yet, but I struggle with my tongue tremoring. And so I then kind of stutter and I can't get my words out because of it. And could you help? And so I said, I don't know. As far as I'm aware, there's no research to say, like, I always try and look at what hypnotherapy research there is out there. Even if it's a small study, it's still helpful to see, oh, yeah, there's been these couple of small studies and then seeing, do the studies sound promising or not? Uh, sometimes you think there's a small study, but it sounds really badly done. And it's like a single case study or something uh, with a client. So in the same as here, I'm talking about a single case study. So I wouldn't take, I would take it with a grain of salt if I saw this written down somewhere and tried using it as my, you know, oh, this definitely works. But it might, if the person uh, didn't have anything else to try, then obviously I might try it. And I did, I tried it with them. Um, so again, I just did the same thing. I asked, when does it happen? I said, I can't obviously guarantee any results. I'm not going to charge you because I can't guarantee any results. Uh, you can't guarantee any results anyway, but I said, I'm not going to charge you because this is entirely experimental. There's no evidence to show that what you're seeking, this me doing hypnosis with you, is clinically valid as a way of treating this. So I don't want to charge you for something that doesn't at least have, uh, you know, oh yeah, you go to a person you know, who does hypnosis as well as the therapy to get treatment for whatever the problem is. And so I refused to charge them and did the same as I just mentioned. I asked, when do you find that it's worst? When do you find that it's better? Uh, are there times when it just doesn't seem to be there at all? Uh, or you don't notice it at all? Um, are there times when you expected it to be bad, but it just didn't happen, or it wasn't anywhere near as bad as you expected? Or when you didn't expect it to happen, and it happened? And so I asked these sort of questions, tried to work out the pattern of it. And then I just spoke to them about their thing was, if I'm really relaxed, it's as if my tongue relaxes, and although my tongue's still moving and I can still talk, it's as if my tongue's relaxed. And so I'm able to hold conversations with people and it doesn't tremor. It doesn't kind of vibrate and get stuck at sort of not being able to talk. And so I just spoke to them about how their tongue can remain in a relaxed state so they can carry on about their life like normal, but their tongue can just remain relaxed. And then I did a few generic stuff around trying to heal the body and uh, you know, turning on and off genes and things like that. And uh, based on what I'd learned about essential, so I did lots of research about essential tremors, as you would do uh, before seeing them to try and work out, okay, how does it develop? The person doesn't have it diagnosed earlier on in their life. They don't have it present earlier on in their life. So when it develops, how does it develop? And there was sort of things I was reading that were saying, 
that it might be epigenetic and that certain genes might suddenly uh, turn on, become more activated, and that that can lead to it. And so I was reading these sort of things. So I just did some work, obviously, around that, um, thinking, well, if genes turn on, maybe you can turn them back off again, but, you know, the sort of, uh, the sort of the epigenome. Then, so I worked on that as well. Um, and I know that I haven't seen them for the last couple of years for very obvious reasons. Um, and But before that, I think probably... I saw them when I had the little boutique shop with Abby. So that was what, 2019? So I saw them in 2019 at that point, uh, they still weren't experiencing a tremoring tongue and hadn't done for years and it hadn't got worse. So um, yeah, they, they're not necessarily cured because it's supposed to be incurable, but um, it hasn't got any worse. So things like that, the same with Tourette's is that you can sometimes get a result where you essentially suggest, say someone says, uh, I don't know, that tick happens when that tick doesn't really happen when I'm relaxed. So you then suggest that part of their body can remain relaxed, even when they're active doing stuff and hope that they understand your implications from all that to keep that knowledge of how it's relaxed you know what goes on that makes it so it doesn't do that when it's relaxed so that it then doesn't do that for example tick uh, obviously you can do other things like talking about time distortion and how the ticks can happen with the same regularity but in real time that time period lasts much longer and uh, or you could have it that you suggest that ticks happen over a small period of time but then they've all happened so a day's worth of ticks happen in like an hour or a minute or whatever but then don't happen again for the rest of the day you've got it all out of the way in one go so there are different things you can do and different things would work with different people uh, some are very overtly kind of hypnotic like using time distortion uh, and things like that others are just helping a person to do more of what naturally works for them and less of what doesn't. Um, but yeah, with the handshake induction, I read that somewhere. Uh, with the handshake induction, um, I'm sure lots of people have been doing it for years, but uh, Milton Erickson is possibly the first one to, he's the first one I know of who recorded about doing it. Uh, I'm sure there might have been earlier people that I haven't, I can't recall right now or haven't read. Um, but back in, I think it was the 1950s, early 1950s, maybe the 1940s, he was uh, doing a lecture about hypnosis. And he was told, you know, if you're so good, hypnotize this person. And I want to, and as a way of proving that you're the one doing the hypnosis and that it's not a person play acting we've got someone who doesn't speak english to be your subject and so he then uh, did his pantomime technique which involved also doing a sort of you know touching lightly on the hand type of handshake induction uh, and then leaving the person stood there looking at their hand and clearly hypnotized uh, so he had to do something that didn't involve uh, actually communicating with words because they couldn't communicate. He knew they couldn't speak English, so he couldn't communicate using the actual words. Um, and then obviously, more famously, Richard Bandler developed his version of a handshake. So Erickson did a couple of versions of a handshake induction, one touching lightly on the hand. So you shake hands normally, but then you touch lightly on the hand and withdraw your hand while engaging in you know, normal chat with the person face to face. So they don't realize at what point you stop shaking their hand and what point their hand is just staying there because you've left it there. So it's kind of an ambiguous handshake induction. The hand stays levitating because they don't realize that you've moved your hand and let go now. Another one is 
kind of taking it with the opposite hand. So going in for a handshake, and then while talking, as, as you go in for the handshake, they you then reach forward with the other hand, and then you, you're you holding their hand, essentially, and talking to them, and they think it's kind of being shaped. But uh, you then can move your hand away and leave their hand there. And then you had, in, I think, the late 70s, Richard Bandler developed his version, which was kind of a hand-to-face type of thing, uh, where he would kind of say, hi, I'm Richard, and put his hand out. They go, oh, hi, and they put their hand out, and then he would take their hand, put it up towards their face, and say, look at that spot. And as you look at that spot, your eyes can defocus, and as your eyes defocus, the eyelids can get heavy and want to close. And then while he points to the center of their hand, he then moves their hand very slowly towards their face. So the eyes do defocus because the hand's moving closer to their face. And then he's given the ideas while moving the hand towards their face. And then he says, yeah, and as your hand touches your face, so you can go deeper and deeper into hypnosis. And so he's interrupted the pattern and then put the hand to the face. And I've obviously got the video of me doing that with Graham where, uh, so my best friend who I'm fortunately passed away, uh, 2020 um where he creases up laughing because i start laughing we sort of laugh together um i I think i snigger and that triggers him laughing because when his hand went to his face i then sat down and uh to let him go into hypnosis on his own i sat down his hand just looked like a face hugger from alien on his face and all i could think of was him having a face hugger on his face and um that made me just snigger he then creased up laughing um and then obviously since then you've got things like how banyan did his eight word induction which isn't a handshake induction but it's a you know his um push down on my hand close your eyes sleep kind of one uh just using eight words um there's a couple of stage hypnotists and people like uh Terry Silver, Terry something, can't remember, uh, used to do stuff. I'm sure it's Silver. Um, Tom Silver, I think. Uh, he does a lot of handshake inductions. So he's uh, so a lot of stage hypnotists have frequently done things like pulling on someone's arm and all that kind of stuff. But all of it is just alternatives on interrupting um, a pattern and uh, doing something that triggers a sort of pgo wave and a response to say i want to find certainty and then you say sleep or whatever you want to say and then have them follow it um You could suggest through post-hypnotic suggestion for people to dream certain things. Um, dreams can be quite ridiculous in themselves already, uh, even without you suggesting a strange uh, one. So you could have someone suggested to dream their Superman. Obviously, the other side is whether they remember the dream or not. Uh, but you can do the same for yourself. Obviously, before you go to bed, you can say what you want to dream about and increase the likelihood then of having that in your dreams, especially if it, you don't resolve it in terms of um, you know, what it is that you're uh, saying. So when there's an unresolved pattern, you normally close it in your dreams. So if you start something, like start part of a story as the post-hypnotic suggestion part or as what you're telling yourself, then obviously that increases the chances that your brain will think, I suppose I'm going to have to finish that now. And so then you're more likely to dream the resolution. Um, Yeah, I don't know who the first person was to use the yanking on someone's hand thing. Um, I've seen it in things like um, 
what's his faces but sorry to blind you Uh, tripping over bags now obviously it's in things like ormond mcgill's books including this one which isn't a bad book it's very easy read um but in terms of if you are interested in stage hypnotism and you just wanted uh things really easily laid out i'm going to turn that around so i don't blind you while i move around yeah um so yeah if uh you want something really easy to read then that's obviously a very very easy quick read um that can give some ideas around it yeah i didn't know that stephen jeffries apparently created the eight word induction rather than cal banyan but i know that it's always been referred to as the cal banyan eight word induction um but yeah there's a lot of i'm just going to put that there for now Just move those ones a minute. Because um, a lot of the same kind of content is in things like obviously there's another Ormond McGill one professional stage hypnotism. His secrets of stage mind reading. and his uh, art of stage hypnotism um but then you've also got things like uh, obviously uh, stage hypnotism a lot of older books on the topic which i quite like because uh, they smell nice um but because they always have fun old photos in them uh so this is from 1901 i'm not sure which ones of these i'm sure some of these have various shock type induction but i'm just trying to see normally the shock ones in these older books are things like tipping someone backwards and then saying sleep as you then lower them down to the floor and that kind of thing um and obviously more modern ones things like this one Yeah, well, my main issue with all of these books is how simple uh, all the th stuff is in them. They don't really go into anything uh, of any interest, anything of any kind of uh, depth. So a lot of the, well, all these books do repeat pretty much the same type of stuff, just written by different people. Um You could suggest to remember a dream. It may or may not be remembered, but you can suggest it. And I do very much like the smell of old books. Um, I'm going to have to put all my stage hypnosis books back again at some point. Now I've got them all out um <clears throat> but yeah i generally like with all these authors i've no idea the names of most people um most people 
I read their books. There are people who I've got lots of books by them, so I know that they wrote a lot. Some are better known than others. Um, but I never remember the names of anyone, generally. I'm definitely not one of those people that's good at sort of saying, oh, yeah, this is this person's induction or that person's induction. Because I my brain just doesn't work once it comes to people. It works very well at remembering random information, does very bad at remembering the names of people associated with the random information. Um, obviously, I've got books like... Uh, over in my far corner and a stretch over everything move some Ericsson out the way was that one there was something else I was over here for what was it it will come to me Uh, I've got books like that, which I know not so many people have. The second edition of the Deep Trance Training Manual. That wasn't what I went over there for. I can't remember what I went over there for. Uh, let me read. Old Musty Books. I'm trying to see what it was I actually went over there for. Um What's one you do have? But well, you've got a copy of that. A lot of people have a copy of the uh, first edition. I've never met someone who has a copy of the second edition. that was obviously the first edition which is very easy to get hold of but yeah you're the only person i've known then who's got the second edition um i've never met someone who's got that one don't feel so special now having got hold of it if someone else has a copy of something I've got, I quite like having things others don't have. I'm not going to go through this part. These are just ones on regression and past life regression and stuff. Um, oh, okay. It's not there. Oh, no, I've moved it. Just trying to grab a book. I moved it behind the Marmite. Uh, yeah, I've got things like, obviously, Dave Elman's findings in hypnosis uh, obviously signed to his sister Um, everyone obviously hallucinates it's obviously how we see largely most of what we see is um, not really what's actually being seen uh, and obviously we all have a blind spot that we fill in constantly that you only notice if you do something to draw attention to your blind spot um, 
so we all hallucinate and really the the main things with hallucination are some people are very good at hallucinating stuff some people aren't very good at it uh, i've never really seen a anything that seems to point necessarily to 100 percent why it's it seems to be that definitely people who are very kind of creative and artistic and um very imaginative generally are more willing to be flexible with their reality than people who are not that i'm not going to say analytic because there can be people that can be very analytic and very creative at the same time yeah very analytic and very kind of good at imagining like um what's his face old guy dead i've got his books that should make me remember tesla that's the name of the guy yeah um he obviously was very analytic and very good at stuff analytically but then also was very good at visualizing and imagining things and would create stuff in his mind and when it works 100 percent perfectly in his mind only then would he go and uh build it um I would have no idea whether MI6 secretly uses hypnosis to create mentoring candidates, but I know that since at least the 1930s, if possibly early 40s, it's been being done um, because there's obviously declassified information about it. And people like, um, what's his face? George Estabrooks wrote about it and was involved in a lot of the uh, early research into it it did narrow it down a bit maybe not quite enough um so yeah so with things like hypnotic hallucinations um the main thing is if someone's more creative and more willing to be flexible with their thinking then they're likely to be more likely to hallucinate um that's kind of the general thing but then it also depends what you're hallucinating so if you have someone hallucinating something perfectly reasonable for that situation like if someone's sitting in a chair and you say um oh don't mind my dog uh then the the idea that someone could own a dog isn't unreasonable <clears throat> and uh so the person might well kind of imagine that and might end up imagining the dog licking their fingers if they've got a hand hanging off the sofa or something might imagine hearing the collar all those sort of things um but if uh, you said to them oh ignore my dragon in the other side of the room they might not experience that because they might think they know dragons don't exist there's not going to be a dragon across the other side of the room that's never going to happen so they don't hallucinate the thing because they just it doesn't fit with what they believe reality can be but someone else might sort of do it because they've got no nothing against having that as part of their reality um well estabrook's main focus was on the use of hypnosis uh rather than the drug side of things i'm sure he probably did mention uh, or do drug bits as well I haven't read the stuff by Esther Brooks lately. Uh, not since I did my uh, video about it, uh, about the dark side of hypnosis, which is obviously on this channel. There's a video called The Dark Side of Hypnosis that goes into some of that stuff uh, and Esther Brooks books, as well as um, some of the bits on Deep Classified stuff. But I've got a lot of books on that topic, as well as Esther Brooks stuff I've got lots of other books uh, someone could hypnotize themselves to hallucinate something again it would come down to the individual and uh, whether it's something that they're able to achieve for themselves with sometimes it might take practice and it sometimes is easier to do things uh, with help so sometimes the focus on trying to do something distracts you from being able to follow it Have I ever seen something I can't explain with hypnosis? Um, possibly yes and no. 
uh, I've seen stuff uh, or in my early days. I used to experiment an awful lot. So pretty much I've been interested, obviously, in hypnosis for my whole life since being a young teenager. Uh, and that was a very, 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 very long time ago. Um, but when I was in my early 20s, myself and my best friend would experiment with all sorts of things. So we were both fascinated by things like the paranormal, by stuff to do with the paranormal. Um, it didn't mean we believed or disbelieved. We were just very fascinated that if something's claimed, well, let's test it out and experiment and see what we find or don't find. Uh, so we tested out things like uh, electronic voice phenomena, as probably everyone has done at some point in their life. Um, going to a graveyard, sitting down in the graveyard, uh, turning on a dictaphone, sitting next to the gravestones, not talking and having the dictaphone on and just having a headphone from so uh, headphones were in it and then we had one headphone each um and just listening and obviously while we were sitting there we started hearing voices on the uh, dictaphone and could hear them around us and circling around us and all well, that's what it felt like and seeming to get closer to us um obviously i'm used to uh the idea of how we do find patterns in things but that doesn't make it any less scary when you're in the middle of a graveyard at midnight in the pitch black um it's a very you know your brain is wired to respond to the situation as this is already a scary kind of situation um so you know we've, we've experimented with stuff like that we've done things like um uh astral traveling and had weird experiences of that with hypnosis we've done past life regression future progression the past life stuff was very interesting but there was nothing that came out that could be confirmed um yeah there's nothing that could be confirmed as uh being real um you know some stuff would match up when we we go and try and research it some stuff would match up and some stuff wouldn't and my view was that if pretty much all of it doesn't match up then it's probably coincidence and there's a lot of stuff you can just work out like what a house might look like at a certain time in history and all that sort of stuff what people might be like or whatever so for me it's only convincing if it pretty much all matches and if it's not that good then um that's not convincing the future stuff i've spoken about a lot before but the future progression stuff was more weird because apart from possibly it being a self-fulfilling prophecy um it's harder to explain how the future progression stuff was so accurate and the future progression stuff unlike the past life regression stuff was 100 percent accurate and that made it even more weird so um that's harder to explain i don't think there's anything necessarily unexplained like as in paranormal or something uh, i just don't necessarily know a convincing explanation that covers everything that we'd experienced um so one of them was that when i was uh, a teenager the lottery had just started in the uk and so one thing i thought was let's use hypnosis to try to mentally see the future to win the lottery and the first time i tried it i got um the numbers i watched the lottery and my thing was i've got to do it and it's got to work more than once before i believe it so my thing was, I'm not going to buy a ticket. I'm not gambling here. I'm not going to buy a ticket. I'll do it. If it works, I'll do it again. If it works, I'll then buy a ticket and do it again. You know, do it again and then buy a ticket. Um, so I did it the first time, and the lottery numbers were exactly what the lottery numbers were that I had written down. So I didn't buy a ticket. Possibly a mistake. Um, didn't buy a ticket. 
lottery numbers were 100% correct. And but the second time I did it, it didn't work. And the third time I did it, it didn't work. So to me, I just thought, well, that was literally coincidence. Uh, so by didn't work, I mean, literally nothing came through. Um, I didn't get any numbers. So it's not like it didn't work. I wrote down a bunch of numbers and those numbers weren't the right ones. It literally, I got no numbers. Uh, then a few years later, when I was in a long-term relationship and living in a bit of a dive of a bed sit um, with the person I was in a relationship with, I decided I wanted to enter the lottery and thought, let's try this again. And I thought, I've not tried this for years. It's like six or seven years or something, probably six years. Trying to work it out. Five years. So it's like five years later, thought, um, not tried it for ages. Let's try it again. And I have a bit of a lack of trust of people being honest. Uh, I sort of feel that when it comes to things like money, people aren't honest. So what I did was I recorded a uh, cassette tape, self-hypnosis tape for myself, that on that cassette tape reaches a point where it says, you know, see what you're doing on the Saturday night at, or Wednesday night, I think it was Wednesday, at this time, uh, watch the lottery results being, you know, watch the TV, watch the lottery results being drawn on TV. Because that's obviously what happens, that at a certain time at night, the lottery results get drawn on TV. So I then had the dictaphone that I'd recorded the self-hypnosis track on, uh, recording me listening to the self-hypnosis track so that the dictaphone would then pick up my answer when I say what is on the TV screen. And so uh, when I listened back to the dictaphone afterwards to see what I said, I was talking complete rubbish, in my opinion. I was talking about some random strange events about, you know, the, the thing was, say what you see on the TV. And I was saying this stuff that didn't make any sense. So I then assumed it had failed, thought nothing of it, didn't buy a lottery ticket because it wouldn't have won anyway. I wouldn't have uh, no reason to think it would. It would just be me buying a ticket and guessing. So I didn't buy a lottery ticket. I um, just carried on with my life, got to the Wednesday. And during, I think it was Brookside or something, a soap that used to be on over here, I turned to my girlfriend and I said, this is so familiar. I've got deja vu. I recognize this. Why do I recognize it? And she's like, well, it hasn't been on before. This is literally, this is before the days of, you know, streaming services and stuff. Um and on-demand TV. So she was like, well, this hasn't been on before. You haven't watched this. And I was like, well, I, ha I have. I recognize this. I'm literally, I've got deja vu that I know exactly what's going to happen. And I was then telling her, this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen. And it played out exactly as I said. And then I sort of went and said, I've got this recording. I know where this is from. And it turns out that because the recording was of Brookside, or whatever the soap was that was on, that we were watching on the Wednesday night, I didn't watch the lottery on the Wednesday night, which meant that the recording of what I was watching on the Wednesday night was the thing I was watching on the Wednesday night. And the only reason I was watching that on the Wednesday night and not the lottery is because the recording said something that made no sense that wasn't the lottery. So I didn't know if it had worked, for one, you know, did I genuinely see that thing in the future? Or if it hadn't worked, it was just coincidence or something. Or if, because if I had, if I hadn't done the hypnosis, I would have probably watched, bought a ticket. If I just thought normally, I would have bought a ticket, watched the lottery on the Wednesday night, looked at my ticket. Did I win? No, right, change channel. Let's carry on with our lives. But I didn't even buy a ticket or watch the lottery because I got a soap on my recording and just sort of a TV drama on my recording. So it became a kind of weird, like, because of the record, because of me looking in the future, assuming that's what happened, me looking in the future meant that what I saw was shaped by the answer I gave myself in the present 
meaning that I didn't watch what I wanted to watch because of the, I don't know, it's confusing. So that kind of confused me. But obviously following on from that, a couple of years later after that, um, my best friend and myself were doing some hypnosis. This is like 2004 or something. We we're doing some hypnosis and just spur of the moment, I thought I'm going to ask him to go to the future. And I just randomly picked a date any date in the future randomly picked a date and said you know what are you doing on this date he then said what he was doing he said i'm um uh i've just turned the tv on uh no i've just finished printing something on my printer and i've just sat down on my sofa turned the tv on and uh now i'm looking over at the uh so I said, what's the time? He said, he looked over at his clock on his um, stereo. He said, looking over at the clock on the stereo, this is what the time is. And so I wrote down the time. He then said, something has now startled me and I've just dropped the paper that I printed off on the printer. And I'd asked him also what he was watching on TV. And he said, it's a bizarre new show. Um, it's, I think it's called Des and Mel and it's got Des O'Connor and some woman called Mel in it. And uh, so... I then wrote all these details down on that day at that time i telephoned him to see how accurate this was i startled him with my telephone call making him drop the paper he just printed off on the printer and as the phone was ringing that made him look at the time think who's ringing me at this and he looked over at the time saw the time got startled dropped the paper and it was me on the end saying just checking to see what you're up to see uh, how things are going um, so again, it was one of those, if I didn't do the hypnosis, we I wouldn't have phoned him. If I didn't phone him, he wouldn't have dropped the paper or looked at the clock. He was watching Des and Mel on that, at that time as well. Uh, both of us were working at Butlins at the time. No, he was working at Butlins at the time. I was working in care homes. Um, so he was working random shifts. There was no knowledge of in advance of what shift on that date in the future he'd be doing because it was different shifts every week you'd go in on like the monday morning and be told here's what shifts you're doing this week so he didn't know what shift he was going to be there's no reason to suspect he was going to be um actually on sort of not on shift and actually at home so the whole thing was just strange so but when we've tried to replicate it on purpose so the times it's worked have only ever been when it's been a spur of the moment thing. Uh, it's only ever been when I've done it spontaneously, like just thinking, oh, I'll give this a go. And then I do it when I have thought I'm going to try that again. And I actually put effort into it. It doesn't work. So as soon as I try on purpose to put effort in, normally something doesn't work out. Whereas that first time I do it every time is when it works, um, which is a little bit like... Um, Who's the old guy? Russell Targ? A little bit like Russell Targ's thing with the stock market. I think it was the stock market, silver market, something like that, where uh, he wanted to see if you could use um, having someone who can see the future, allegedly see the future, tell you whether, stock, whether the stock market will rise or fall, and then making a buying or selling decision based on what they tell you. And they won big following the advice of this person who could tell them uh, the stock market. They started getting lots of money. And so they got in Time magazine and other things because of the success they were having. Uh, you know, the headline was like a bunch of psychics are winning the stock market kind of thing. Um, and so the following year, they decided to try the same again. But now they were actively doing it and, and focusing on let's try and make, make this much money. Previously, it was like, let's do this experiment, see what happens. Now it was, let's try and make this much money. And they found that they failed straight you know, continuously. They couldn't manage to do it. Um, so as soon as they tried to do it on purpose as an actual thing, rather than just a, oh, I'll give this a quick go, see how it turns out as an experiment. Um, once they're actively trying to do it, it stopped working. Um, You had a dream of a dream of deja vu. That just sounds confusing. That's just confusing my brain.
but yeah so the future progression stuff i find quite interesting but at the same time my view is there's got to be a clear explanation for it um yeah dreams within dreams a lot of my stories go that way they have dreams within dreams because it's really a helpful process to do to dream within a dream within a dream i'm sure i saw something else written down somewhere that i think has probably scrolled past What does a dictaphone do? How could you actually hear voices? That's what I saw that I didn't answer. Um, yeah, so a dictaphone obviously just audio records your voice. Um, my dictaphone at the time was a cassette tape one. And the alleged theory was that a cassette tape dictaphone with the slight random static that you get within a cassette tape audio recording, that, as I say, this is an alleged theory, that the spirit could you know, manage to turn that static use what's there to turn that static into um some kind of you know speech or whatever sounds that a spirit might want to create that was kind of the theory of it um and the idea is that if there's not the static there then it doesn't work because there's nothing for a spirit to use you know no background noise for it to use to kind of turn into something um so I imagine modern day high quality equipment probably wouldn't work for the same purpose, but uh, obviously static is very good for you to be able to have, don't know if it's called pareidolia when it's audio, if it's still the same thing or related, but you know what I mean? Uh, the whole thing of finding popular, finding common patterns. Hello, thanks for joining us. I don't know how long you've been loitering in the background waiting to say a word like that um so yeah so it's uh suddenly finding the pattern in something is obviously very very likely when there's static there and you're expecting to hear something um but as i say that still doesn't make it any less scary when you're in a, an actual situation where you start hearing it um i think i also saw a comment asking about scary stories but I don't know how far back that was. Um, so yeah, have I created, I've created intentionally scary videos. Um, I've created over the years, a few scary stories that are intentionally scary stories. One I think is about 40 minutes long and one's an hour long or something like that um and obviously i've got the seance one where i use hypnotic techniques to make it similar to if you watch darren brown's the seance i use similar techniques to that um but i'm doing it via or the plan was to do it via kind of youtube so i'm doing it through a computer screen um i don't know which came out first seance or my video or the Darren Brown one, but uh, it's a similar kind of idea where I'm just giving suggestions to lead people's automatic movements into eliciting a specific spirit in the room with them um, while they listen and follow along to me in the background. So I've done things like that. Obviously, one of my horror story things was to make it so that essentially to try and make it so that someone would have the experience of the ring, as in the film with the girl coming out of the TV, out of the well and then out of the TV in their real living room. So the idea was to encourage people to hallucinate while they're sitting on their sofa to hallucinate this thing climbing out of their actual TV in their real room and hallucinate this real scary person coming into their room with them. Uh, it confuses me that, and I contacted the um, people that made the first paranormal film when that first came out, saying, if you did this in your you know, found footage type film um, and you mixed in these techniques, wouldn't that make it even more effective? Um, but yeah, it's uh, they never got back to me because I thought that that would be the ideal thing. They were using a specific 
sound on the track uh, on their videos for helping to emotionally impact the viewer just as a ghost was about to appear but they didn't use other techniques that they could have used that could have made it far more real um but yeah uh obviously i've written um horror stories generally vampire stories and things so i used to like vampires and things um i made a very friendly halloween story which i did during one of the live streams um and even though I tell people up front, it's a Dan story, so it's a nice, friendly story. Uh, and I say in the description, it's a Dan story, it's a friendly story. There's no scary stuff in this Halloween story um, because I know what people can be like. The Halloween story still ended up having people saying, oh, I'm not watching this, I'm unsubscribing because you're posting scary Halloween stories even though literally there's nothing scary about it at all. It's kids going out, having fun, trick-or-treating, and I think seeing some bad guys get beaten up at one point, just a bit of martial arts. Um, so it's not even scary beating up. It was just some martial arts, I think. Something that I thought would be fun in a story. Um, but yeah, I intentionally don't post scary horror story things. The Hypnotic Assassin was enough for you. Yeah, that's not remotely scary, but it does have some blunt, gory moments. But when I was younger, I definitely used to like doing um, scary stories. I used to like, like, um, and I used to like doing scary things with hypnosis on people I know that is, like Graham. Um, things like those of you who've watched Darren Brown for many, many years will know where he did the, I'm just going to you know, build a wall around those deep, dark fears and I'm just going to remove one brick. And he's got a light behind him and he puts his hand out and he then says, in a moment, I'm going to remove that brick. And when I do, you'll feel the deep, dark fear, whatever, coming flooding through. And then he removes the brick and all that fear floods through. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so I've done things like that with Graham to, you know, we sort of, we watched it in like 1999 or 2000 or whatever it was. And I turned to Graham and said, we've got to do that. Are you up for it? You don't mind being terrified, do you? I'll put the brick back afterwards. And Graham was like, yeah, I'm, I'm up for this. So, you yeah, know, we did the whole, right, I'm removing a brick and Graham's freaking out like crazy. And then it's like, oh, I'll give, give you the brick back now. Um, Obviously, Graham was up for pretty much anything. So it was like, oh, I haven't tried stabbing someone through the back of their hand with a needle yet. Can I do that to you? And Graham would be like, yeah, okay, that sounds fun. And then it'd be like, right, let's try and do this. Uh, and I'd be stood there hypnotizing him while I'm waving a lighter underneath a needle, um, thinking, best make sure it's sterile first. Uh, so. Yeah. So, but Graham was up for pretty much anything that we would do. And obviously the play that we were trying to work on before he died uh, was going to have certain horror-ish, semi-scary elements to it, using hypnosis to uh, influence the audience. My main channel used to be uh, my very old stuff. A lot of here's what Dan does to experiment and have fun. Um, and it was things like pushing people over, uh, you know, psychically, not really psychically, but you know what I mean? Like I'm going to push you over, stand up kind of stuff. Um, it was all sorts of different bits like that uh, on my channel when I was young and I started on YouTube back in 2007. Yeah, Cyril the Squirrel. Um, doing ventriloquism. But yeah, there was lots and lots of weird stuff and experimental stuff. And um, and the reason I don't post any of it now is because I have to do this for a living. 
and doing it for a living means that all my time is taken up doing stuff for a living and I can no longer do it for the fun of it. Um, I can no longer just sort of get like, like all my stories used to be um, done how I similar to how I'm doing them now. You know, done how I wanted to do them, but far more detailed. So done how I wanted to do them um, because I wanted to do them in a way that was kind of creative. And I'd get all these ideas and I'd uh, want to, I don't do this now, but I'd want to fill them. I'd do double inductions on everything uh, or multiple voices. So I'd have like the main track and then I'd have the voice coming from the left ear and the right ear and the voice down the center for other things and different suggestions in different places. And sometimes the voice like when you i'm doing a staircase induction i'd be counting like you know 20 19 18 17 16 15 and counting so it's like a sort of spiral. my voice is spiraling around your head and then around your body down towards your feet um you know i do all these sort of things that i found fun to do uh and i would just do them kind of in real time so i'd get an idea and i think yeah i'm gonna do that and then i'd uh, make the whole thing together and I'd possibly think of like right this is the music I'm going to use or the sound effects and then I'd create the sound effects that I want in place and then listen to the sound effects while I'm talking so that I can when I'm talking about what you can hear like saying you're walking through the woods I would talk about walking through the woods but I can hear what I'm using as the sound effect while I'm talking about walking through the woods and so I then can describe what is going on in my head. I can describe, oh, yeah, I can hear that bird there and this bird there. And I can hear that sound there and the rustling there. And so I would then be able to talk about my personal experience while I'm listening to the story. So uh, uh, while I'm listening to the uh, effect. So I used to do all sorts of things like that. But it was always done for fun, not because I needed to make a living. Um, now... It takes me, well, I work most hours of most days of most weeks um, and don't have time to do things for fun or because I want to do them. Don't know. I always wonder, well, I think the stories, it, it varies. It depends what I'm trying to achieve. Some normally the stories I think are the best are the ones that the audience thinks are the worst, and the ones the audience thinks are the best are the ones I think are the worst. Um, so sometimes I can do something very simple, like my recent ones. They've just been ridiculously simple stories. They've taken a long time to write because I'm writing them first. And my brain doesn't work like that. My brain doesn't work slowed down to the pace of writing. Um, my brain works better to just do rather than write and then read. Um, but they're very straightforward stories. They're just essentially walk from A to B, describe what's happening on the journey, have a bit of an experience in some way, maybe a bit of an insight, and then settle down then sleep or something yeah they're, they're quite straightforward uh whereas the ones i'm more proud of and normally like i think one of my favorites is the story i made for holly the um post-apocalyptic world one because it gave me because of the suggestions that holly gave um when i said to patreons you know give me suggestions for what you would like in a story no one has ever suggested a post-apocalyptic world as a, a location to have a story set uh there were some bits asking for certain therapy based ideas um in the description as well and so i then um was able to really get into that idea of creating this post-apocalyptic world but was able to be creative in how do i make a post-apocalyptic world that doesn't sound negative, like, oh, there's been a world war or there's been a big nuclear bomb or whatever. You know, it doesn't sound bad, and yet it's still post-apocalyptic. Uh, so I had the fun of trying to figure all that out. And then I had the fun of knowing, right, let's try and squeeze in hypnotic language stuff here. 
I know that Holly likes trying to notice hypnotic language that I'm using. So let's try and put some in for her to try and notice while also trying to put some in that she won't notice and some in that she'll be, she won't notice necessarily straight away, but she'll be pleased when she does notice it because it's just, just obvious enough that she'll notice that. And that'll make her think, oh, I've noticed something that I don't think he thought I'd notice. Uh, so that kind of stuff. So I thought I can have fun trying to put all this stuff in specifically because I'm making it for one individual. Uh, so everyone gets to listen to it, obviously, on YouTube. But I'm making it because I'd asked every individual to come up with what was going to be their story. So I knew I was making it for one person, which gives the freedom of uh, this is what I can do here. And then obviously I wanted the therapy stuff in it. And so I was then like, right, I, I can now come up with creative ideas of doing this extra therapy because normally all my stories are predominantly about overcoming anxiety, um, reducing worry and reducing stress. So it's nice to have something else to include rather than just that. So um, that gives that bit of extra creativity and then trying to think, what haven't I done before? Or how can I do something in a new way around something that I maybe have done? So, you know, that's a story that I really was proud of and then was shocked when I started getting hate because I picked a term that I didn't even know was a conspiracy theory term um, or a term that's been hijacked by conspiracy theorists um, that I used because I thought in the moment it was a creative term that I've heard in other, you know, post-apocalyptic stories, books and things um and so just assumed it was a an common easy to use term that was unthreatening uh, i didn't realize it was actually some really negative thing so that's what i'm proud of and yet i know that it's not necessarily one that's done very well or been looked particularly highly upon um and there are a few like that that i'm proud of for one reason or another um maybe i found them creative or something and then there are some that are just different. So my Dragon's Fire one was done differently to my others in that I actually have a set of characters that you follow across six different stories, um, which I then obviously combined into one video, but uh, it's six different stories that the idea was to try that thing of, oh, maybe if I have re recurring characters, people will come back for the next episode because they'll want to hear the next episode next part in the story and so on youtube that kind of thing you'd think helps you know oh, i've made this but people want to watch part two so then they're going to watch that one and then i want part three so they'll watch that one uh, as it turns out when i released the, f the series initially as individual videos the first one got okay-ish views the others no views at all really <laughs> and so i i was asking people oh how come you know people who like my first ones how come you haven't listened to the others and the main response was because people are asleep the main response was i fall asleep within minutes to the first story i don't hear the end of the first story and i don't want to listen to the second one if i don't know what happened in the first one because i don't want to ruin it for myself so no one ever went and listened to my future stories because they all had that kind of even though every story is technically self-contained and it's a Dan story. So you've just got to assume they've successfully achieved the outcome of the first story. They'll successfully achieve the outcome of the second story. Um, people were like, well, I haven't heard the end of the first one, so I can't listen to the second one. And then they never hear the end of the first one. So they never listen to the second one. So it, it backfired. Uh, it meant that I made six videos and people only listened to the first one, which is why I then decided to just merge them into uh, one video. Um, and I've no idea how many people make it through the video. But I think people start and stop and just pick up in a different point that they think, oh, I remember falling asleep about then. So, yeah, so I don't necessarily think of my stories as getting better and better with each one. Um, I just do something different um, at different times. How do I read without sounding like I'm reading? Um, I don't know if I do read without sounding like I'm reading. 
part of it depends what I'm reading and how I'm reading what I'm reading. So by that, I mean, if I'm reading something, trying to read in a very specific, like a fast paced way, I'll stumble at some point and I won't be able to keep that up, that pace up because I'm not one of these kind of high level, um, you know, hyper type of YouTubers who can talk really fast. So if I, even if I'm reading, so if I have to read something at quite a fast pace, then I probably don't do a particularly good job. Um, I don't do too badly, I don't think, reading auto queue. So I, I sometimes set up an auto queue for some of the mind changers videos, and I've done them auto queue to camera. Um, it would be easier to do them auto queue to camera with a auto queue managed by somebody else rather than just scrolling at a fixed speed or changing pages at a fixed speed or something. Um, if I potentially had a remote, maybe I could then change the pages of an auto queue so that I could just read what's on one page, click a button, read the next page, but I don't have that. Uh, I'm not that advanced. Um, but I don't generally mind reading auto queue. I find that relatively straightforward. Um, sometimes I get, I don't know if bored while reading is the right term, but while I'm reading, for example, auto cues or off my computer screen, if I'm reading, uh, say, a story or something, my brain is thinking about other things while I'm doing that and talking to myself about other things, not necessarily focusing on what it is I'm doing. So I'll sometimes end up glazing over and then not having what I'm reading in focus anymore because I've just gazed through it or uh, I'm, I suddenly look off somewhere or something. Um, and then I have to bring myself back and no, pay attention to the writing. Um, and I suddenly realize that I'm doing it and that I've stopped stopped focusing on it because in my head I'm focusing on something else like perhaps how I'm going to say a certain word that I know is coming up or um, whatever it happens to be but I find it very hard to generally to read um, in what I would see as a natural kind of way Alcohol might increase your suggestibility uh, or your chances of just doing following suggestions. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily make you more responsive, um, but it might make you more likely to follow some suggestions. But then with some people, it might do the exact opposite. Just like some people become more angry, some people become more relaxed. Obviously, Generally, you would strongly advise against someone having alcohol and doing hypnosis or anything like that. Because you probably want them to be able to pay all their attention to what you're doing, not having the alcohol clouding that. Um, I don't know if I've done superhero stories. I think I probably have. I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that I've thought about doing it, so I'm sure I must have done out of 300 odd stories. I've absolutely no idea, but I'm sure I know I haven't for ages. If I have, um, I haven't done like a Superman one, but I've, I think I've done ones with um, uh, people with different abilities, as in like a superhero type abilities. But I haven't done like a here is Superman or Spider Man or something. Um, but I can't remember what off the top of my head because it's been over 300 stories that I've done on my channel. We have been here for three hours and 13 minutes and apparently 22 seconds. Thank you. It's very kind. But yeah, so I haven't done a superhero one as in here is a superhero saving the world, so to speak, or saving the day, because I don't generally go down the road of doing things where there's anything too kind of dramatic. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. The lighting has changed over three hours because I revealed I was heading over to the books and back because I had some questions that involved me getting books off the shelf, of which I have a few, 
um, and it doesn't take a lot to get me to start flashing books. And it's good that a lot of this three hours has actually been spent people asking about hypnosis, which is very good. I know some of these streams, although they've been focused on hypnosis, um, uh, or that's always been the plan. Um, people haven't necessarily always asked me about hypnosis and then I've ended up talking about other things just to try and uh, wait until the conversation starts. But actually here today, uh, most of this three hours, I think, has been spent um, on hypnosis. Uh, I'm not tall and the ceiling's not short. The ceiling's quite a way above me, but it's the lighting. The lighting's casting weird shadows. I think it's because I have things right up to the ceiling. I can't reach the ceiling now. Yeah, I can just about reach the ceiling if I'm on tiptoes. So it's not that that high. Or well, not that low, even. I'm 5'11", so the ceiling is... Uh, and I may be British, but I don't know that in centimetres. 180? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, the ceiling is way above my head. But you're looking off into the distance. Because the background's all the way back here. Cool. Thank you for popping by. So, yes, any other? I'm still in my head shocked that um, uh, someone else has a book I've got that I thought was rare and hard to get hold of because I never see it for sale anywhere. Um, I have uh, worked with a number of alcoholics. Some of which have um, had alcohol within the period of time that I'm working with them, um, which is a bit of a pain because obviously it means they don't necessarily engage fully. They're perhaps a bit dozy, a bit distracted a um, bit sleepy, um, not necessarily remembering what we've discussed fully, not necessarily engaging fully with everything. Um, but obviously sometimes uh, if someone is an alcoholic, the chances of, especially like a first session, the chances of them being sober for it and you getting that first session. If you say to them, I'm not going to do a session with you until you haven't had a drink and you have to book in advance, you, know, you don't have immediate space to see clients or something, that's not particularly feasible. So sometimes you just have to see them, even though you know they're not going to be in a particularly fit state, to really engage with the therapy um, and just see what you can do to try and help them a bit. Um, I Well, the best one for... Uh, see, this is how I, I read a sentence about booze in the first... So I read the next sentence thinking, money for drunks? What's we talking about there? And it's not. Get their chunk is what it actually says. Um, but my brain scanned it before my eyes worked out what it was actually saying. Um, yeah, the best one is probably the PayPal me link, because then PayPal takes a very small amount, but it's not like YouTube's 30% or 40% or 30%, I think it is. I can never remember. Different people take different chunks from you. Um, but yeah, the PayPal me link, which is obviously on my about page on my other channel. And it's in... 
It might not be in all my videos, actually. I think it's only in my more recent videos because I realized that people couldn't necessarily find it or didn't necessarily look on the about page to find it. You did hear me right. Yeah, I don't have many hypnosis books and could probably count them on my fingers and toes. Probably a few other people's fingers and toes as well. It depends. Um, and I'm always thinking, I've no idea what's going to happen to it. So Abby is obviously already worried. You know, I'm only in my mid 40s, but you never know what life will throw at you, including death. So um, yeah, Abby's already kind of thought, what happens if I die? To all my books because i on one hand i don't want them to be separated i have a you know all of these hypnosis and therapy books which is predominantly everything you can see i'm trying to work out where that stuff yeah everything you can see including on the stand here a lot of those are hypnosis e therapy books obviously all these behind me all on there all these uh half of those ones the other half of martial arts and then there's psychology ones and stuff um so already lots of talking about uh you know sort of what happens to them all where do they go who can i um give them to or have them sold to or you know what what can happen to so many books um if i'm suddenly not around or something um because it is a lot of books to find a home for and you want them to just you don't want them to go to someone who's just going to think oh i'll take them so i can flog them all for this much you know each book or something uh you want them to go to someone that says you know i would love to have a library of books and have them all you know as like a starter collection because that's what i see it as i see it as a little bit of a starter collection uh for somebody who's just in the early stages of gathering books on hypnosis and therapy and stuff um yeah i imagine the post to uh, america because <laughs> there's books obviously in this collection i i often joke although joking on a, on a live stream is probably not the best place to joke um because someone will go i'll make a note of that i often joke that um if someone came in here to steal from my flat They'll probably take the PlayStation 5 and the TV and they'll probably not touch the books, um, partly because getting the books out are probably heavier and harder to carry than a PlayStation 5 and a TV. Um, but actually, if they're good at hunting and they know what they're looking for, there are some uh, expensive books behind me. Yeah, you don't get many of them coming in with a top hat and a cane and uh, white book gloves. But yeah, for example, I know that that Ericsson set there, I've got to work out what my, way my finger has to go now, that way, that Ericsson set there um, is each copy there was only i think 500 copies of each copy printed so each of these each of these volumes there was only 500 that, that each one was a limited run of 500 and there was a lot of people who only bought individual volumes and i've got the complete set so i know there's I know that there's uh, fewer than 500 uh, people because I know lots of people only bought individual volumes. I know there's fewer than 500 people in the world who own that set as a full set. Um, it is, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I um, 
have a book somewhere on my shelf where it's a replacement book. Um, somebody said, oh, I'd love to borrow that book. I lent it to them. They had it for a few months. They then, uh, it was a work colleague, they then gave it back to me one day. When I lent it to them, it was in pristine, virtually pristine condition. It had been read a number of times by me, but very carefully and sensibly. When they gave it back to me, it didn't lay flat on a table. They just sort of said, oh, here's your book I borrowed, and they just gave it back very kind of nonchalantly, very much like Dan won't notice anything odd about this. And it wouldn't lay flat on the table anymore. Um, and it was very, very crinkled on every single page. And so I kind of queried this slight change to the look of my book. Um, and the uh, their response was that they were reading it in their book, uh, in their bath, and it fell into the bath. Uh, and instead of buying me a replacement copy, they just thought maybe I would never notice. And so they just gave me back a copy that would no longer lay flat. Yeah, I don't, I've got ears in old books that I've never made that are there because whoever owned them before me put them there. But yeah, I encouraged them to purchase me a replacement copy. Um, luckily for them, it was only like a £30 book. Uh, they did, I now am reluctant to lend any books out to people. But I do have some replacement books. And I do sometimes just buy people the book so that I don't have to have it back. Yeah, there is the possibility of giving the collection to a public or university library, but then I'd be reluctant to do that, uh, ideally, partly because it would probably just disappear and not really, it wouldn't be enjoyed in the same way, I don't think. I think if it was, it would probably end up just mixed in with everything else the expensive books and the rare books will never end up out on display, never end up on a, an actual public shelf. I can't imagine things like Neuropnology, my copy of Neuropnology, being on a public shelf in a local library or even in a university library where the average person is going to read them. Um, I see it as it's more likely to be enjoyed by an individual who actually enjoys reading and looking at books, uh, who hopefully interacts with other individuals who do the same. Yep, that is that drinking climb. And that did help him to stop. And obviously the advantage is that if someone is a spirit drinker predominantly, um, they're going to feel very sick faster from gulping back pints of lager or something than they are um, when they sort of drink this, than they get drunk, than the amount they get drunk from drinking a spirit. Uh, so if you can have them feeling sick faster than they get drunk uh, and then they're not enjoying the drink, then um, that can it, it just shifts the pattern. Obviously, it wouldn't work with everyone, but it was right for that person. I'm generally not too bad with books. Most of them stay in reasonable condition. Oh, have you been gone? I hadn't even noticed.
<laughs> it's a bit like the um i don't know how many of you watch sherlock as in the david Cumber uh, david benedict cumberbatch series um where uh watson gets out of the chair leaves the room comes back days later and sherlock has just been talking to the empty chair all that time and it, he comes back in and says what are you doing you still there talking and he goes yeah yeah and uh he says oh i didn't even know you'd got and he is completely oblivious to the fact he'd gone but yeah, at least you're able to take a break <laughs> i've been stood here the whole time you do make a very big impression but at the same time it's very easy for me not to realize who's in the live chat and who's not because obviously i spend all my time trying to keep up with the chat sometimes it stops and then that's easy to keep up with but especially if i'm running behind the chat as i was earlier on in the chat i'm just trying to read all the right all the white writing and my brain doesn't even register uh the names i don't even look or focus on the names that are in like blue or gray my eye just scrolls down the white writing and I try and just read the actual uh, comment. Yeah, I've, I think librarians, I've, always, I've liked the idea of working for the library service, except that they're often having to do job cuts because people don't go in libraries often enough nowadays. Um, but yeah, obviously the librarians really love books. I think the difficulty is that if there's rare books or a collection of books or something, they just end up going into like a collection area or a rare book area and only very limited types of people can see them. And then uh, it's not, people don't necessarily know that certain things are there or they don't know the good thing about the books. So for example, I have some books, you probably wouldn't go to the library. You wouldn't see them. So um, you wouldn't go to the library to find them. If that makes sense. So an advantage of books on a shelf like this is you just flick through, you sort of see something and say, Oh, that looks interesting. And you take it off and you look and you found a book you've never searched for. If, a book say just any one of my random really old books was in um a library and because of it being rare it was put into a you know behind a cabinet somewhere and it was locked away and you could only access it if you asked to see it it may not be the type of book that someone instinctively thinks i want to go to that specific library to see that specific book that they've got in that library because they don't necessarily know about that book may never have heard of that book before um whereas i think if it's out publicly on a shelf if it's too public a shelf then it will get ruined if it's not public enough you know if there's not enough people seeing the shelf then um no one will see it either so it's trying to get that balance um but if it's locked away it probably would never get seen unless it's a rare and well-known book The blue and grey names, blue are moderators um, and grey is everyone else. So doing a live chat like this isn't so bad, but doing the sleep story creation sessions, I definitely needed to have some moderators to help because if I was expected to be writing down comments like uh, ideas people were suggesting, and writing down uh, and then talking and saying something it's very hard if i'm ad-libbing say a story and doing that trying to keep in in that zone so that i don't ruin it for the viewer as well i don't want to have to get halfway through a story and pause 
so that I can delete someone's comments because a spam person has suddenly jumped into the live chat. So it's very, very um, helpful when I was doing that, especially um, to have moderators who could jump on to these people and delete their comments rather than me having to try and do that and keep going, doing my normal thing. Um, so moderators are very, very good at doing that, uh, at jumping on things. They also have to um, sometimes accept comments. So sometimes the most random comments get blocked. It's really weird. Uh, sometimes it could just be someone saying like, hi, Mandy. And that's enough to have the comment blocked <laughs> for daring to say it. I have no idea why. Um, so, yeah. So there are some comments and some people that, for whatever reason, constantly get blocked. And it's just handy to have someone who can unblock them. And although I, on here, try and unblock them, I'm normally beaten to the unblock. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one book on hypnosis, what would I recommend? That would be difficult because it would depend exactly on what you want to know or learn um obviously i would always recommend my books um i'm very proud of my hypnotherapy revealed books that i'm writing uh i don't have enough time to finish writing the series i've got about halfway through writing the kind of dark side of hypnosis type um i'm trying to remember what what i was actually writing um I've written a little bit of the parapsychological hypnosis book, uh, probably half of the dark side of hypnosis book, a little bit of the making a living book, um, probably a quarter-ish of what I want to include in the hypnotherapy transcripts book, probably half of the idiodynamic healing book, probably less than a quarter of my working with couples and families book, uh, the Therapeutic Transformations book, I've probably written about half, maybe just over half of that. And then I've written the transcripts and transcripts, hypnotherapy and Ericksonian approach book. So, um, but I don't have time in my days to carry on typing and to write the rest. Uh, so, so far, I've only got three of them released. Um, but yeah, so it would depend where you're at and what you want to learn. So if you want to learn about, say, um, stage hypnosis, then obviously there's stuff around that. And it will then also depend on what kind of stage hypnosis or street hypnosis. If you wanted to learn about the work of Milton Erickson, then it would also depend on what kind of bits of his work, whether you wanted to learn, say, about things like how he about say hypnotic language patterns or things like that or whether you wanted to learn about therapeutic approaches so all these kind of things are very different things to learn um and all in very very different books if you just wanted say a book of scripts for example not to read hopefully as actual scripts because i would always advise strongly against that but um if you wanted to read say or get ideas from scripts you wanted the scripts books so that you can get ideas from scripts then again obviously there's different books for that and then it would also depend what kind of scripts you're thinking of um there are non-hypnosis books i'd recommend in relation to hypnosis if you wanted to learn more about things like hypnotic communication or you know ways of communicating non-consciously or ways people can receive communication non-consciously and process things um there are books if you wanted to be good at therapy there are books that i'd recommend on that that are not hypnosis books um so yeah there's uh very hard to find a single book if someone's a complete beginner then i normally recommend something like jeff zeig's um introduction hypnosis i think it's called the induction of hypnosis or I recommend, I can't think of the name of it. 
Uh, Michael Yapko's just got to move Peter Rabbit out the way. Essentials of Hypnosis. Um, and there's another one somewhere that I recommend. So Michael Yapko's The Essentials of Hypnosis is a good one. Jeff Zeig's Introduction induction of hypnosis is a good one and um edwin jaeger's can't even remember what i watched clinical foundations of hypnosis or whatever it is that's a good one as well um i don't know if i've read any dark hypnosis books um obviously i've got a lot of different hypnosis books uh i don't own a kindle i've purchased some kindle ebooks over the years but i generally like physical real books so i've had e-readers since i don't know 2005 or something um and been reading pdfs since before that but i don't particularly like reading things in that way it doesn't work how my brain works i like to have, be able to feel a book and know how far through i am based on how much of the book feels like it's left or looks like it's left as well um so i like a physical book because it lets me know you know i'm on whatever page i've got that amount left that amount i've read or while I'm reading, I come to something and I just think, oh, I want to go back and recap something based on what I've just read here. I'd like to flick back to that bit back here because it makes more sense now. So I just want to reread that bit. And that's easy to do with a real book. You can flick forward, you can flick backwards, you can read a bit, uh, you can skim the book. Um, you can skim the book, you can, uh, it's much easier, I find generally for example to speed read real books uh like for rapid learning of knowledge um yeah like taking the book going through doing mind mapping of it uh i did that when i was uh having to learn psychoanalytic approach um but yeah i find it very hard to do a lot of how i read uh, and how i take notes and stuff if i take notes on anything I find it very hard to do all that um, if it's a digital book. But I do find digital copies, uh, especially PDFs, I have a lot, of, a huge amount of PDFs, thousands of PDFs. Um, I find them very, very useful when it comes to writing books and referencing things. So if I'm writing something and I think, oh, where do I know that from? I got that information from somewhere. I can then find that information because i can do a, a search across the pdf files for certain words to see where those words appear and then it will give you a little summary of the sentence around the word and i can see oh there it is found it that's what the actual quote said and then i can talk about it in my book or whatever um i generally do my best not to impose my will on people um I like most i like to assume most people try to not impose their will upon others um i've got no problem with people talking politics if it's in the context of uh, in the right context where you're actively with the person just talking about something and engaging in civil sensible conversations where you can hear what their perspective is and why they think that and if they're willing to talk without getting strongly emotional that's what irritates me when um people get very very emotional about it rather than being able to be reserved and that doesn't mean they don't care they're allowed to care but in relation to the actual conversation you want them to be in control of themselves not losing control of themselves just to talk about something um so i've absolutely no problem talking to someone about politics who agrees or disagrees with me 
as long or religion or any of these kind of topics as long as they're willing to stick to uh, facts as best as they know them and be willing to prevent you know provide um, any evidence which I have to be to the same standard obviously um, but provide any evidence if asked for if something seems unreasonable uh, or like it needs so uh, a common one that said in relation to the evidence thing is you know if somebody said um oh, i've got five pounds in my wallet that's not an unusual claim to make so you would sort of think oh, okay it's, yeah it's you could be lying to me but who cares it's that is literally something that is likely to be true because you've said it and there's no reason for you to lie but if someone says i don't know um I can't think of something that wouldn't accidentally spark potential moaning or something. Uh, but if someone said something that clearly, like, you know, um, I don't know, the moon is made of cheese, well, that's very likely to be a lie. You know, where, where would be your evidence for that? That is something you would ask for evidence for if someone genuinely is saying that as a genuine actual claim, not just joking. Um, you know, there, there are some things that it's like, it's fine. You know, that's a reasonable thing. We all kind of agree that that's likely or realistic. And that goes for, I'm using those as extreme kind of examples that are non-threatening, hopefully. Um, but the same goes for politics, religion, uh, all sorts of other subjects, that if someone is going to make a claim that sounds a bit outrageous, whether it's me or someone on a side I believe about something, or on an opposite side or whatever, you just have to be able to say, well, here's what's led me to believe this. Here's, you know, here's what evidence I'm using that's led me to believe that. And whether I see that as suitable evidence or not, obviously that would have various standards of what I think is suitable or not. But that's, you know, that's the kind of conversation I'm happy to have with people rather than dismissing certain topics from being allowed to be talked about, which because they could be difficult topics or could lead to conflict. I just think, you know, we all disagree on things and we'll agree on other things, hopefully. Um, yeah, I think everyone should be curious and actively listening and accepting that people have their own views and we don't have to all agree. Um, But yeah, I think uh, yeah. No, to, I, I'm happy to talk about a lot of topics that I know others aren't happy to talk about. And I, unlike you, I share my opinion about things when a situation arises where my opinion is going to come out of my mouth, um, and I don't particularly care if people are annoyed by that opinion or not. Um, I don't give the opinion with the intention of annoying anyone, obviously, uh, but I just see it as this is my opinion and these are my reasons for it. Yeah, I wouldn't, unless a client brought it up, I wouldn't bring it up in like a therapy session. If you brought it up and you agreed, clearly that's going to be very good for rapport. So if um, some client came in and was ranting about, I don't know, Boris Johnson's hair or something, and I was thinking, yeah, I totally agree um, with what you're saying, then that's obviously where we think the same here, so that's good. Um, there's lots of stuff we probably wouldn't think the same about. But if they, um, I wouldn't bring it up myself, but I wouldn't say, we don't talk about that here. I wouldn't, I have never said to a client, you are not allowed to talk about something because I am uncomfortable with it. I don't think that should be talked about um, because I see that as kind of shutting them down. But there are things I, you know, 
I obviously, any therapy session is led by the client, not by the therapist in terms of where the conversation is going to go. Obviously, you're there for a problem, you know, to treat a problem. So the length the client, the therapist is going to go to is, you know, what would you like help with? Uh, what would you like to achieve? Those sort of things. Um, you're not going to be saying about other topics. You're not going to, I'm not going to burst into a conversation with a client who's not there to hear me do so um, about hypnosis, for example. They've got no interest in hypnosis. But if they ask me, so how does this hypnosis thing work? I'll give them a brief example or discuss or explanation about how it works. Um, but that's not why they're there. They're not there to learn hypnosis as in the subject of hypnosis. So I wouldn't obviously put that upon them, even if I'm interested in it as a subject. Uh, likewise, I'm not. But if I was interested in football, I wouldn't say, oh, did you see the game on Saturday or did you? Because that's not therapy. That's not part of therapy. That's not what we're doing. Uh, if they were wearing a football shirt with a specific you know, team and that team I knew had won a game a few days earlier or something, then as a on entering, say, getting to the therapy room, you might kind of build a bit of rapport by saying, you know, did you see the game the other night? If I don't know anything about football, so I wouldn't ever say it. But yeah, if you recognize that that shirt is of a team that won or something and you think, oh, um, maybe they're a fan of that team then. Um, but you wouldn't generally be doing any of that any more than you, know, you might ask about the weather or something. But you know, like asking how they, you know, how things have been or isn't the weather nice or something. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you wouldn't want a, you don't want a therapist to put their own beliefs upon you. Uh, not just about religion and politics, but about anything. You don't want the therapist to... So I, going back a, a lot of years now, when I was learning about psychodynamic therapy, uh, a manager of mine said, right, I've got a question for you because you seem to think that people should go to therapy with whatever they've got, you know, whatever problem it is they want help with, get the help for that problem and then leave therapy. And he said, but my training with the Tavistock Institute, which is who I was then put to train under uh, in London, said my training is as a psychodynamic therapist that people go to therapy and they stay in therapy until they are fixed. And so he said to me, so how do you feel about that then? How do you feel about you know, if someone came to therapy for you you want them out the door quick and but they may not be fixed and i said well what are we talking about here I said if someone came to me to quit smoking no say i think i said if someone came to me because they were depressed and they smoked and they said to me um i want to have help to overcome depression i would help them to overcome depression and then i would stop that would be the end of the therapy they came to treat the depression they don't need to treat the depression now because they've they're no longer depressed. They've left therapy. And so this guy, uh, my manager, said, But you haven't fixed them yet. They still smoke. And smoking is wrong. They shouldn't be smoking. And my thing was, well, I'm a non-smoker. I've never ever smoked in my life. I've always wanted to smoke, but I've never smoked in my life. Um I personally think smoking isn't a particularly pleasant habit for somebody to have for them or for the people around them. Um, but who am I to tell someone who is an adult who's doing something they're legally allowed to do that they're not allowed to do it and they must stay in therapy until they stop doing it because I'm a therapist and they're not fixed yet. And his thing was, no, therapy, they should stay until they stop smoking as well whether they want to or not, you've got to talk them into staying in therapy until they no longer have any problems in their life, including things like stopping smoking and losing weight and everything. Um, and so, yeah, to me, it's like that's forcing your beliefs upon someone. So beyond the religion, politics -y type thing, that's like I have a belief in how people should be 
that sort of idealized human being and unless you meet that idealized version of a human being you have to stay in therapy uh, but that's an idealized version of a human being that i have why should they have to meet my version of an idealized human so i've always done it that you know i'm happy to walk away from someone who i know is in trouble and in need of help for other things if they don't want the help and as a therapist my belief is that you have to be willing and able to accept yourself for that because there's a tendency when you want to help people to think but i really want to help them i really know they need help for that thing and but if you're not being asked to help and they don't seem to want you to help them for that you leave the door open for them to access it if they do decide they want it but you don't force help upon people you don't say you must have this help you're broken essentially and i've got to fix you you know is i think that one of the biggest things therapists have to learn is how to know when to stop for yourself yeah you know, how to know when to stop and when it's you saying something because it's your belief rather than you saying something because it's what a client wants uh, so there are some things you've got no choice about so for example with uh, child protection cases they might say I don't want to improve the life for my child I'm happy to be abusive to them it doesn't bother me um, and then you know your role may well be if you're say in a social worker kind of capacity to say well no that's tough there is a way of dealing with children if you don't look after your children in that appropriate way they will be removed from you so then it's different because you've got safeguarding of someone else it's not just about that individual anymore there are sometimes for example if you're working in say a mental health um inpatients kind of setting that potentially you've got to have um you know be quite assertive around people around mental health or around um say addictions and things like that on the sort of impatience bit that you're doing um but these are very specific types of examples for general everyday therapy your role isn't to be forcing people to have treatment that you think they need when they're telling you it's not what they want to have you wait and hope that if they do need it they'll come and get it when they're ready um I don't know what hands-free hypnosis is. Given that technically nearly all hypnosis that someone does is hands-free. So unless it's someone branded type of thing that I've not encountered uh, or don't know by that name. Um, Because obviously most hypnosis you don't touch clients as a general rule uh, in fact the only time i've touched clients in terms of doing hypnosis is during demonstrations where i'm demonstrating something in front of an audience like you know lifting an arm or uh doing some kind of a handshake induction or something like that where it's for demonstration purposes uh generally with actual clients there's distance between me and them and I don't have a need to touch them. Um, it's not relevant, so I don't. So if it was just hands-free hypnosis, as in you don't touch the client while you hypnotize them, then that seems like they're just saying hypnosis, but putting the words hands-free in front of it for no reason. Um, yes, my assumption is that it's not as innocent as hands-free hypnosis because of the risky comment and that's what i would assume it's related to and i don't think i have that many books on it in relation to that subject um
uh, it's not something that I've ever done on my channel, and it's not something on any of my channels. It's also not something I'm likely to do because of the potential negatives in terms of like um, the fact that it could end up being that you've encouraged a certain state in somebody that can feel very much like um, abuse on them. So I worked with a, or no, I worked indirectly, uh, more the way it worked. So I'd, I'd helped someone years and years and years ago uh, overcome various problems they had, and they're in another country. And they encountered somebody who claimed that they had encountered a hypnotist who did kind of you know sexual domineering kind of hypnotic stuff on the internet and that they were sort of intrigued by this and they went and engaged with this person on the internet and in their content and had struggled with various kind of um, issues following that uh, around domination and this person suddenly having power over them because they'd engaged in the process of the person having power over them and had it kind of go too far. Uh, and so they needed some help. They, they ended up becoming traumatized by their experience and by what they mentally had been subjected to as part of it. And initially they saw it as something very exciting and fun that they were doing, but it reached a point where it, it messed them up a little. Um, so I ended up having to try, sort of indirectly via this person who I'd helped uh, a few years earlier than this, uh, indirectly go through them to help this other person because they'd gone to that person for help. And uh, that person was like, I'm way out of my depth. But because of the nature of the problem, they refused to go to anyone professional or to go to. Um... So this person studied hypnosis uh, and had taken a few hypnotherapy diplomas and things but didn't feel very confident themselves especially not dealing with something like this so i kind of was indirectly going through that person to have that person do the therapy with the other person um but yeah so it's it's something that in my mind is kind of anything that gets in to seeming like you could be seen as having abuse um is or like you know where there's anything that gets into where there's a power kind of setting power control kind of setup where there's someone with a one-up position on someone else and it can come across abusive and potentially um you know almost like sexual abuse in the term of what i'm talking about uh gets a very difficult situation um i think to do on something like youtube and because the person doing it may be very skilled at what they're doing and a lot of people may sort of think this works really well for me and uh you know does a very good job for me at whatever it is they're trying to get out of it but there will also be a lot of vulnerable people who can't find yeah who are very vulnerable that's the reason why they can't find partners or whatever else and those vulnerable people are sat at home in their rooms on their own looking for connection looking for say you know sexual stimulation from others kind of thing and end up discovering this content and thinking i'll give that a go that's you know i'm up for that and then they're they're vulnerable, but the person who's doing the content doesn't know that this vulnerable person's engaging with it, and what the impact of that could be. And sometimes, if they meet them like face to face via Skype or something, or Zoom or whatever, um, they still don't realise this person's vulnerable, and they're still doing the same sort of things. And it it gets a it it, it can be a bit kind of dodgy. It's not it's not something I would ever. Um, do but in terms of if your question that you haven't asked is along the lines of the ability for people to be able to uh, elicit all sorts of different states and feelings and experiences literally you know anything you can dream you can and i literally mean dream uh you could elicit through conversation through talking with someone 
uh, you know, through using things like hypnosis, etc. Um, because all you're doing is essentially eliciting certain things. Um, but the other one is that, for example, if I started talking in a very sexualized kind of way, that would probably come across as very strange, I think, for people. Uh, a bit like ASMR. Yeah, if I was doing ASMR in just a kind of generic way, that's fine. But if I do a ASMR and I'm trying to do it in a kind of sexualized voice or something, for want of a better word, that would come across very, very weird and probably come across lecherous and freaky and just some people may enjoy it. Um, there's bound to be an audience somewhere for it. But it it wouldn't necessarily be the right thing for me to be doing but that doesn't mean that if someone wanted to um experience something they couldn't for example if you wanted uh say somebody was lonely they struggle to date or whatever or they've been in a pandemic for two years and haven't they're single and they haven't got out of their flat for two solid years to see another human being then that individual making themselves a track that guides them into a state where they can experience you know, essentially your own inner virtual real reality. You, know, you can eat, just you can do that. Um, they could have their own virtual reality fantasy thing. Um, perfectly fine. Some people would be very good at having that inner virtual reality experience. Some people would struggle more to experience it because we're all different and some people are good at visualizing some people aren't some people are good at feeling stuff and having emotions evoked some people are really not that in touch with emotions and can't and really struggle to have emotions evoked some people are really good at having physical sensations evoked some people are not good at that so there's obviously variation in every single one of us um but you know anyone could practice and could do it um and it's probably the kind of thing that's better for someone to do for themselves because then you're in full control of what's going on and what you're guiding each other through. Um, so, yeah, it's just something that I wouldn't necessarily, or definitely wouldn't be doing on my channel uh, or my channels um, and don't really even talk about those sort of things uh, purely because of the impact it can have on vulnerable people and I always try never to have a one-up I always try my best not to be in a one-up position with people to not be the oh Dan's the expert who's better than us all let's kind of bow down to him I don't want that role I want the down-to-earth normal person who just happens to know some stuff but then so does everyone else and everyone's sharing different knowledge because we're all knowledgeable about different things um, you know, I may have knowledge about hypnosis, but someone else may have knowledge about something else that I don't know much about. So, you know, I like to be on the same level as people, the same in therapy and in pretty much everything. I like to try and keep things on the same level, not put myself in a position intentionally of power over anyone or status over anyone or a one up over anyone. Um, So anyway, and I, I felt it was important to answer all that, but I do, I think I have a couple of books about the topic, but I, I have a lot of books um, on different, on hypnosis. So I have a couple of books. I might have mind play as well among my books. Um, and I've got a couple of other similar books. I think I've got some VHS videos and DVDs as well. Uh, that I got from a good friend who was getting rid of some of his hypnosis collection um, that I don't think I've checked out yet, but I've got them in my collection because obviously it's to do with hypnosis and that's good enough for me to have it in my collection. Um, I don't like to be judgmental and say I'm not having that in my collection because of the topic or something. Um, apart from the person who wants all the power who, who you're standing in the way of. But yeah, so I wanted to make sure I at least covered that, my view on that. Um, as I say, there's people out there who do things like that and that's entirely up to them. And 
we all have to live with the results of what we do so it could be they don't get any negative come back on it so there's nothing inherently wrong with what anyone's doing necessarily um but uh, obviously i'm not talking about individuals because i don't necessarily know individuals but i mean kind of generically there's nothing wrong with people uh using hypnosis in creative ways that can bring pleasure to people or to themselves um but i think people have to obviously be aware of you know they're responsible for the consequences of their actions if there are negative impacts because of their behaviors uh, and we all are obviously so anyway it is now half past midnight my time uh, i've been talking for four hours and ten minutes which is a long time to stand here talking well, I haven't stood here talking the whole time. I have walked over there and over there a couple of times. Um, but it's four hours, ten minutes of standing talking. So thank you all for listening this long, for the nine of you who are still here. Um, I know some of you, it's been bedtime, your time as well, uh, as well as my time. So uh, I am going to head off, go to bed. And, yeah, this is probably going to be... If I can think of an excuse for live streaming, I like live streaming because um, I like sharing knowledge. I like having an, uh, an opportunity to share knowledge with people who want to learn knowledge and hear knowledge. Um, it's just very hard to find people who seem to want to know stuff. Um, so, oh, yeah, gaming live stream. I think that came up last time and I don't think I I think it disappeared before I answered it. Uh, gaming live streaming probably not i don't know it's the challenge is that i always end up doing it late at night like streaming generally i always end up doing it late at night obviously my time um and i'm normally tired when i'm doing it and for the gaming i end up having to set everything up plug everything in um do it all in the living room so i can use my tv for the actual gaming because normally I want to be gaming something on the PlayStation 5. Um, I can technically possibly set something up in this room on the computer. Um, but yeah, that's the main challenge is that it's late at night and it's trying to figure out what. So the the live streams in terms of gaming the live streams that um yeah 10 more hours i can match my record the live streams that i like watching would have someone just chatting with a live in the live chat about rubbish you know whatever you want to chat about kind of thing while playing something like minecraft or when abby watches one it'll be they're playing animal crossing and they're just chatting to the audience in the live chat while playing animal crossing but then you need people to be willing to chat uh, and a game like that say it was minecraft for example is that you literally there's not a sort of a big agenda to it or something so but it it can get i'm sure some people would find it very boring if you're just watching say something like um minecraft for hours while someone's just chatting and gaming and you know building a pyramid or something um that's what I normally end up building. Uh, so I don't know. I like gaming live stream live streams, um, but it's hard to think. Oh, what am I going to play tonight? I've got to find a new game to play, or I'm going to play that game, but it's gonna I'm going to be rubbish at it, and I'm going to get stuck, and then I'm going to be playing for hours and hours and hours, and then I'm going to have to play the next week and the next week, and um, and then I'm going to commit myself to having to play this game. And whereas you kind of want to play something you can pick up every week and just carry on where you left off um so i like gaming i don't get to game enough because i'm always working part of not live streaming gaming is because my channels have been doing so bad the mind changes one and my main one and my udemy stuff especially since they changed their pricing to a new format as a, an alternative option a kind of spotify type format 
that's brilliant for students and bad financially for instructors is um, that I end up then having to put so much time into everything I'm doing to make sure I'm making a living that I then don't get time to do uh, the whole gaming thing. Um, but yeah, if there was an audience that said, we would like, we would be happy with you just um, say playing my, because I like it when you don't care what the person's playing. You're just more kind of interested in having a chat in the live chat. A bit like here, I feel that it's the live chat that's the bit that people are interested in. And if while I was having this chat, I was playing a game. And so what on screen, instead of seeing me, you might see a little me down here. And um, the rest of the screen is like Minecraft or something. I suspect you'd happily have had this chat with me for four hours while I had a Minecraft pyramid being built or something. Um, that apart from zombies may be attacking me. Uh, isn't particularly stressful. It's a laid back game with nice, relaxing music or something. Um, but yeah, it's the main issue is that it's late at night and um, that it's a bit of a faff trying to set it all up if I'm doing it all the time. Um, and so it's finding an audience and obviously that I have to so far put so much work into my other stuff like you know my recent story that those of you on Patreon have got took 40 hours or so to make plus even longer to make the video for that one um, not as long as the video for my one that I've just made uh, for the 21st or whatever it is um, which isn't it's just a you've all heard it before it's just a remake but it's uh it's one because ne this week is abby and mine's anniversary so i'm trying not to be busy this week and that means that i can't get a, i don't have time to get a video done for the 21st so i've had to rush out one i had scheduled for november bring that forward and change the formatting a bit so that i can release it uh, in just over a week's time so yeah we will have been together for 21 years and married for eight years. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to make sure I give time to Abby rather than work. Um, but, yeah, it is now four hours and 17 minutes. So I look forward to seeing you all later. Uh, so the gaming one I may or may not do. Um, I'll figure it out, see if I do or not. But. The chances are this will be the last live stream in relation to doing this course, but the chances are I'll probably do some kind of live streaming at some point, even if it was a once a month live stream to give students on Udemy a chance to ask questions and anyone here in the live chat to ask questions, but not linked to an ongoing course on YouTube so that I don't have the pressure of making the video and doing a four hour live stream. I can just do the four hour live stream um and then lose my voice and not talk for a day but yeah it's um something like that might happen so anyway i will say bye again for about the third time in 15 minutes and uh see you all on whatever the next video will be see you later